Welcome everyone to tonight's study session. Um, just remind everybody about our ground rules. Um, this is a meeting for council to ask their questions and hear presentations. And so if anybody needs to have a conversation, they can go out into the uh, area where we usually meet. And um, what other fun things? Um, council reminds you about cell phones. Unless your stuff for the meeting, I know some of you put that on your cell phone. Um, I think that all covers tonight's stuff. Um, so my report um, last week, uh, Councilor Seymour and I went to Jefferson County Mayor's and Commissioners meeting. Um, they talked about housing for the homeless. They had different looks at housing from tiny homes to attached and the different kinds of attachment you could have. Um, they are, and I told you this, that they are having the county man or city managers and county manager um, look at this and take it further because each city is doing, the, we need to get coordinated to know what everybody's doing. Um, then I went to a Adams Kelly luncheon. Um, Debbie Tuttle, who is their North Glens EDC person, is retiring. And so um, they have a new award there. It's called Game, Game Changer Award, and she was presented that. Um, she has been a wonderful person for to Westminster. I know when I first got on council, she just is willing to share anything, talk to you, help you understand stuff. They've been a good partner. Um, and then went to, with Parks and Rec to Adams County to receive two grants from Open Space. They got 1.9 million for that. So congratulations to them. Then went to Hometown Christmas uh, down in Historic Westminster. It was freezing, but good. Um, and wanna thank Rich Newman and Parks and Rec and Library for helping with the new lights for the tallest Christmas tree lit in the state. Saturday was Victorian Christmas at the museum. It had great turnout. We even had people in period costumes. So it was fantastic. City Hall lighting on Saturday, uh, and for weeks I've watched the elves working when it was nice weather so they didn't have to freeze too much, which I'm glad. But Saturday night was just, the only word I could think of was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It was fantastic. And um, so thanks to all who helped with that, especially with the events that night and entertainment. And then last night, the fire department, this is their fifth night, tomorrow night's their sixth night. Um, they have been, if you haven't seen the fire truck, I've got pictures, but it's lit up. It's beautiful. And it's the old sea graves. Santa comes on it and um, meets with the kids there. So we're in open space. We haven't gone back to kid, uh, houses yet. And people signed up. Uh, they take 25 cars a night. And um, Nutmeg showed up last night and took pictures for everybody. And you got to watch the magic in it. And um, Nutmeg loves this time of year. And then this Friday, I have lunch with the Northern Adams County. So anyone else? Um, so I mentioned last week that I would provide just a quick overview of what the Dr. Cog session was last um, in November. And um, aside from approving the sub-regional call um, for tip number three, um, we had an overview of a couple of things. And I would suggest um, taking a look at the, there was a 2021 annual report on traffic congestion that, and I guess Dr. Cog does this every year. And so it's really interesting to see um, regionally how we've, how we were doing within the COVID era and just um, they're kind of, they're tracking the recovery of traffic mm -hmm. congestion and just where are we going as a region and has COVID really impacted our traffic patterns or not? I mean, it, so it's a good quick summary and I can send over this, um, this link so that you guys can all just take a quick look at it. Um, and then this uh, this week we have a work session for Dr. Cog, and it's going to be focused on um, how we handle housing re regionally. And the feedback 
from the all of the cities when we did the original um, just brainstorming session was really for Dr. Cog to be a convener and to just help get information, help get uh, cities the you know connected to the funds that they're looking for, and or just help coalesce access to uh, to new opportunities. So that's what they're going to flesh out a little bit more this week. So that's on the books. Number two. Um, just two quick things. One, the um, EAB canceled their meeting for the last month, which would have been on last Wednesday. They didn't, um, their chair, I know, was out of town dealing with some uh, personal stuff. And they just, he said they just didn't have enough of content to go through to meet, so they didn't meet. Um, it sounds like they may plan on meeting in December, but I'm, I don't know yet. Um, I know also the other thing I was going to bring up was the inclusivity board was working on a statement around the, the Q shooting, Q club shooting. I don't know where that's at. I was trying to, I can't get their page up, so I'm not sure if, if they worked that out or not, but I know that they were working on a statement that they wanted to make. So um, I'm, again, I'm not sure where it's at or if they finished it, but just thought I'd let you know that they were working on, on something. A uh, couple things on Rocky Flats. Uh, uh, Rocky Flats needs to reappoint, and uh, I just assume that we're going to stay with our representative and alternate. But the other very important thing, which I don't view as a risk, but is something that we should be aware of, is Rocky Flats found a whole bunch of PFOAs. PFOAs are these compounds that the EPA, the federal EPA, is toying with having strict mandates on drinking water supplies, and they're really hard to get out because we have a, a much less contaminated source of water from Clear Creek with only six cities sending us their sewage. Uh, we have a pretty small one. The last report I saw is we had a very small amount of PFOAs. We're like Thornton because not only Stanley Lake, they get water out of the Platte. Platte has a lot of upstream, so they have many more PFOAs. Uh, the good part is, is we have the interceptor dam on Woman Creek, and that's the dam that held during the floods of 2013. Uh, but it just is a potential risk to our water supply and federal government needs to pay for it if we have to pull PFOAs out of Rocky Flats. And I had put out an email that because we always take those terms for two years and even if they do it every year, that unless I heard differently, I was assuming the people in place are going to stay in place. Yep. Yep. I know that. <clears throat> Alton, um, Emmons? Let's see. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, a couple of us completed a municipal court tour in preparation of our discussion coming up. I believe it's next Monday. And um, it was very helpful to see and learn in person um, from our uh, municipal judge and um, other staff members about the condition of our court. So um, that was helpful. And then um, just joining you, Mayor, in all of the fun activities through Westminster, through um, Historic Westminster's lighting of their tree in um, on Friday, and then so much better weather on, <laughs> on Saturday uh, for Westy City Hall lighting, um, lots of people. Um, it was great to see so many people out and about um, just getting back into um, regular Westy traditions. Um, it was great. So um, those were all my, and then Thursday um, was the uh, um, North Metro Arts Alliance and just wanted to thank Councillor Seymour for attending that for me in my absence. Thanks. Councillor Seymour. Uh, yes, on many of those things, court tour um, was excellent. I greatly appreciated that background on, on the, I've been to the court several times, but never down below in the uh, 
fun part, but um, or back at the Sally Port. So I appreciate that. Um, North Metro uh, Arts Alliance. <clears throat> it was a short agenda. They just approved a couple of months worth of uh, minutes and then um, they're pending on the budget. Their treasurer was not able to get on at that time. So they've got money. Uh, their big primary funding is um, uh, SCFD and they're wait they've got that money. So then they're going to work backwards on the budget. But other than that, there was not anything they're putting together that 2022 SCFD report. Um, then on um, Friday, I attended um, uh, council liaison to the Colorado Mun Municipal League's uh, policy committee meeting. And thank you for policy and budget for the emails ahead of time on that. So um, those those votes um, for the committee were pretty straight line and they all followed um, our, our legislative policy work. So there wasn't anything, they do a good job. There wasn't anything that came up last minute that we had to worry about. So there was no, nothing out of the ordinary on that one. And then um, um, obviously that's a, a pre-session one. And some of these are voting on uh, some committee work and work groups that are putting together bills for this session. So in some cases they just, it's, they know there's a group, they're participating in the group. There's no bill yet. So a lot of that was um, monitor monitor, 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 you know, or or a, there was a couple that were, um, um, oh, <clears throat> we did take one of the longest votes ever because we went from support with amend to not support to um, not support unless amended. So that, uh, so most of them were looking for either monitor or um, a couple of them that, um, really stepped on local control. Uh, the group was was very adamant as usual is that, you know, if it it's crosses the line into local control, then unless that's amended, um, then then we're gonna we're gonna uh, not support that unless it is amended. So then we'll see the bills in January and it might change all of that. So um, that was that for <clears throat> Friday. Yes, it was cold Friday night, better Saturday. So all for me. Uh, lots of events. But what I'd like to talk about is the uh, municipal. So I was not at the tour, but I shadowed the judge a few months ago for a few hours. And he, he showed me the state of the courthouse. And yeah, that there's definitely need there. So I'm looking forward to when we get to that. But, you know, it was very eye opening. Thanks. City Manager's report. All right, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, uh, we'll get to the next slide. And so just wanted to provide a quick city update. So first of all, uh, the police chief recruitment is on track. Uh, we finished up last week with our community survey. Uh, we had over 1,500 folks that uh, completed the survey and provided input. And so um, that has been helpful in uh, essentially building our profile um, that will go live hopefully tomorrow. Maybe. So we're looking at tomorrow uh, that being posted uh, and then we'll start looking at uh, applications after the new year. And so that move is moving along quite nicely. Um, we've got uh, staff that will be re-engaging interested community members and developing some regulatory and oversight framework for short-term rentals in Westminster. Um, and uh, we'll come back with that framework to the city council in spring of 2023. <coughs> And then uh, some, you know, questions about the Holtzclaw Homestead um, that was raised um, uh, during the month of November. Um, we're working with the owner of the property, which is Berkeley Homes, to remove the remaining debris. Saw them out there uh, this weekend, um, moving some trees and brush and things like that around, um, putting them into piles for easier removal. And so that's moving, but it is a slow work in progress. Next slide. I do think we could. Have a good bonfire and have s'mores. I'm sure, yes, ma'am. Yes, we could. See that from Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> no, they have it in like six piles now. Yeah. Um, some westy winds. So uh, first of all, the visit with uh, Santa at the Westview Recreation Center. We had about 400 community members that uh, attended that second annual event. Um, and uh, families were able to get a photo with Santa. 
Um, there is a North Pole mailbox was added this year, allowing children to send their letters to Santa. I've noticed that that has moved to out front here at City Hall. So encourage the community to come by and take advantage of that. Pretty cool. Um, and then as mentioned by uh, the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and counselors already, uh, two great uh, Westie wins with the uh, hometown Christmas event in historic Westminster on Friday night. Nicely attended, great uh, caroling, um, kind of reminded me of, uh, you know, kind of a small town um, ambiance, very, very nice. And then the holiday lighting ceremony on Saturday night, extremely well attended, very popular, lots of kids, lots of smiles. And so uh, what a wonderful event. And so all three of those great Westie wins. Next slide. Some things to know. So fire department continues their holiday charity drive that goes through December 16th. So folks have food, toys, clothes, um, and they wanna drop those off. They can do so at any city facility. Um, and there are several participating community locations. Um, and these donations support Have a Heart Project, Jeff Co. Foster Care, Santa Cops, and Fish Food Bank of, uh, food bank of Westminster. And so a uh, great way to uh, give back a little bit. Uh, coming up on Wednesday this week, 7 to 8.30, Special Permits and License Board Committee meeting or board meeting. That's right here in Council Chambers. Uh, Santa on the Plaza goes from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, this coming Saturday night and the following Saturday night, the 17th, Westminster Rotary is uh, doing that. And we thank them for assisting that, assisting with that. Uh, and then uh, City Council meeting, um, and that's the one where we'll talk to the municipal court uh, conversation. Uh, we'll get a presentation on that, the need for that, as several council members have mentioned. But that's next Monday night, starting right here at 6.30 in council chambers. <clears throat> next slide. And as always, encourage folks to reach out and contact us. We are accessible, we're responsive. Uh, we are certainly transparent. We wanna be accountable. Um, please call us with your concerns, phone, 303-658-2006. You can email me directly at uh, mfrytag at cityofwestminster.us. And I encourage you to connect with us. So you can do that on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and um, uh, what's that called now? The neighborhood next, next door. door. There we go. That's the new one for me. So um, at any rate, uh, those are the uh, updates that I have. And then we'll move to the next is the information um, update. Uh, it's on the annual update of water supply plan impacts from the comprehensive plan amendments. Um, uh, it's provided information only. If there are any questions, we can certainly answer those. Otherwise, we can move on there. Does anyone have any questions on the information about the annual update? Okay. Sarah, thanks for it. I, it was good to look back. And thanks for the good report. That brings us to presentation on specific plans for downtown. And so, um, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, counselors, uh, we're going to provide you a quick uh, presentation on the specific plans that go specifically towards uh, the downtown and then also to Westminster Station. Uh, I did want to, and then how they relate to the comprehensive plan. Um, I did want to share with, uh, with everybody something that was a takeaway for me um, as we were doing the events on Saturday night here at City Hall. For anybody who was coming into City Hall, they were looking for how to get to uh, down to Santa. Um, but for those that uh, were willing to wait a little bit, they diverted over to the model of the downtown. And I saw a lot of folks talking, gathered around the, the model, watching the video, asking some questions. I fielded a few myself. Um, and uh, you know, definitely uh, folks um, were interested. And the big question was, when is this gonna be done? And so um, I share that with you as we um, as we uh, go into this special plan discussion. Okay, so we've got John McConnell, John Burke, um, going to lead us in the presentation. So, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. So, staffs here tonight to present to you uh, a study session on the specific plans districts uh, per your uh, instructions on the, uh, the October third study session. Um, I just so, asked, do you want to go through it first and then questions, or how do you want it to go? I, I think we could uh, better answer your questions at the end, if that's okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, I'm Interim Planning Manager, John McConnell, and 
John Burke here, Economic Vibrancy Manager, and Manager, and we're also supported by some of our team members here in the audience as well. So we'll be able to answer any questions you guys have later on this evening. Okay. And so with us tonight, uh, uh, some of the staff we have have worked in the in both the specific plan districts. Uh, from the planning division, we have Stephanie Ashman, senior planner. Some of you remember Stephanie from other interactions. Uh, Stephanie has been the planning division's lead on development review in the station area. And uh, she works directly with John and his team in economic development and implementing that plan uh, through its regulations. Um, Nathan Lawrence is a senior planner in our division. Uh, Nathan's on vacation, so he couldn't be with us, but Nathan provides the same role from the planning division uh, with the downtown. So, um, so next slide, please. So the 2013 comp plan identified five focus areas to target public and private investment and support neighborhood stabilization for the majority of the city's land area. The focus areas comprise approximately 4% of the city's land area and were planned in the 2013 plan to have the greatest potential for growth and change over the next 20 years. The 2013 plan called for the formation of specific plans for each focus area to provide more detailed direction for future development. Specific plans were adopted for the downtown Westminster on November 24th, 2014, and the Westminster Station area on May 8th, 2017. The work on additional specific plans is on hold, pending the outcome of the City Council's consideration of the update to the comp plan and its effects on both land use and the overall vision for each of the focus areas. The two specific plan areas are already accounted for in the water supply plan developed in conjunction with the 2013 plan and do not create new demands on the water supply over and above that. So what do specific plans do? Specific plans provide more detail than the generalized nature of the comp plan. Specific plans function as master plan and regulating document all in one. Specific plans combine regulatory zoning requirements such as setbacks, parking, height, et cetera, with architecture and site design requirements in one document. This makes the process of development review and approval in SPDs transparent and predictable for the developer as well as for the community. So what's the relationship between the comp plan and the specific plans? While the, while the comp plan contains references to the specific plans and illustrates the boundaries of the specific plan areas, the comp plan does not prescribe in detail the allowed development within those specific areas. So just like standard zoning regulations, the city council adopts specific plans separately from the comp plan and the specific plans provide greater control for the city council with regard to development outcomes, as well as predictability for property owners and developers. The adoption of the 2040 comp plan update does not impact the existing specifics plans the city council and the city council retains all authority to adopt new specific plan districts and amend existing SPDs specific plan districts to implement new and changing policies outlined in the comp plan update. So it's important that um, uh, we, we update the comp plan and that would help inform what we do with the other focus areas if we retain those focus areas and if we adopt, adopt specific plans for those focus areas with your guidance and approval. Um, with that, I uh, will turn the presentation over to John Burke so he can talk about downtown Westminster. Thank you, John. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As many of you know, the Westminster Mall was in decline, I think what made the cover of Dead Mall Magazine. And so the city had to do something about that particular site. Uh, as you can see from some of the timelines, the master developer initiated going out of the RFP in 2009. Uh, 2010, 11, 13, 14, 15, with the specific plan being adopted in, I'm sorry, the uh, comp plan being adopted in 2013. What's also important to know, the city took th this head on with the acquisition of strategic parcels. So back in 2009, uh, you may recall the trail dust was one of the first acquisitions uh, the city made in that area. Uh, subsequently in 2010, both Macy's and Mervyn's was acquired. Again, these were all strategic acquisitions in order to clear the site for these master developer conversations. Ultimately, the entire mall was uh, re, uh, purchased in 2011. From that point in time, uh, city council visioning sessions were 
uh, occurring from March of 2012, uh, multiple public uh, engagement sessions, uh, getting feedback from our residents and constituencies to identify what did our residents want to see uh, in this particular site. Uh, those open houses were held from March uh, uh, in 2012 through about uh, April and May of 2012. And then ultimately in 2013, a couple community uh, meetings were held to present the proposed framework uh, for the site plan and the vision for downtown Westminster. Uh, this was ultimately adopted. Uh, <clears throat> Council authorized the contract with Torty Gallus and partners to go out and actually create the downtown specific plan in 2013, which then was adopted in 2014. So next slide, please. With that framework in place, then was established the vision of what this vacant site to left as it was then demolished and the infrastructure needs to support a vibrant downtown. So the city issued certificates of participation and started to build a roadway network with water, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, regional detention and parks and green spaces throughout the entire downtown network in order to attract uh, block by block development from multiple different uh, developers to create that vision of creating a new downtown or a city within a city as we like to say with a variety of uses. Next slide, please. And the culmination of those uh, outreach to our residents really created this infographic of what the full build out of downtown Westminster would look like. Uh, somewhere around two to three million square feet of office is an essential play for the vibrancy and the economics of downtown. Uh, somewhere around 4,500 residents, about 700,000 square feet of retail, which you may recall, uh, the former mall carried about 1.2 million square feet of just retail and surface parking around it. We're also looking at 300 plus hotel rooms. We currently have 125 in the Origin Hotel. Uh, the enter dis uh, entertainment district was adopted this past uh, May uh, by this council for the downtown. Uh, we also have a requirement for lead silver uh, certified buildings in downtown, uh, which is a key element for that uh, water conservation measures that we're starting to see uh, the outcomes of. Additionally, all that location as the comp plan in 2013 <coughs> identified a focus area, this evidently was an area that needed that reinvestment to create that long-term vibrancy for a new downtown. The access to not only the RTD uh, station, US 36, US 36 itself, connectivity to Denver and Boulder, uh, 88th, 92nd, and just that central uh, hub for uh, this, this location. Uh, with that, next slide, please. I'm going to turn it to John to talk about uh, the Westminster Station specific plan. All right. Thank you, John. So the Westminster Station area, SPD, contains 135 acres that's bounded on the west by 72nd, I'm sorry, on the north by 72nd Avenue, Federal Boulevard on the east, Little Dry Creek Park to the south, and Lowell Boulevard to the west. Next slide, please. The purpose of the station area SPD is to maximize support for commuter rail to downtown Denver to Westminster as envisioned with the approval of the RTD Fast Tracks program in 2004. City Council approved a concept plan for the Westminster station area in 2011 and conducted extensive public outreach between 2012 and 2017. The RTD B line opened in Westminster Station in 2016 and greatly exceeded ridership expectations until the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. The city and its regional partners invested $80 million in improvements, including a public parking garage, regional water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure, a world-class train station, and the most significant new public park in historic Westminster in decades, the Westminster Station Park and Nature Playground. Um, all in all, the intent was to stimulate the local economy, uh, revitalize the undeveloped areas in the station area, and increase connectivity between people and jobs in the region. Um, the way the plan is set up and the uh, area is, is uh, framed allows residents to live and work and play in the same area. It also has the effect of potentially reducing dependency on driving through intermodal transportation access. Next slide, please. The station area SPD provides a transition area to orient the most intense development around the Westminster station core and parking garage. And this is illustrated in this diagram in red and the number two. This area transitions to lesser intensity and reduced heights around the edges is illustrated in the blue and the orange areas. 
This deliberate transition supports compatibility with surrounding existing built environment. Unlike the downtown SPD, where the city owns the vacant developable lots, in the station area, most of the property is privately owned and the ownership is further fractured into small lots with existing mostly industrial land uses. The city exercises flexibility with existing commercial and industrial uses in the area by allowing continued operations until such time that the property owner seeks reuse or redevelopment. Next slide, please. Like the downtown Westminster SPD, the station area SPD is a regulatory document containing zoning and design standards and ensure compliance with the vision of the plan. The station area SPD provides an overall cap on development, um, but instead of service commitments, the limit on in the station area SPD is a maximum of 1,340 dwelling units. Like downtown Westminster, this area is ultimately limited by stormwater management and sewer capacity in the Little Dry Creek Basin. Uh, so further increases in density are not feasible over and above what the plan anticipates. Next slide, please. So this concludes the staff's presentation and we thank you for your time and attention. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have several staff members here that can answer your questions. Um, <coughs> so uh, we would like to entertain those questions at this time. If you're ready. Questions? Thank you. Um, on the um, downtown specific plan, um, with the goal of being 4,500 residents, how many units is that? Did so on that infographic, it identified the number of units, which is right around 2,300 okay. units. And that's a mixture of apartments, townhomes, condos. That's all categories of residential is what the 2,300 is. And how many units, including the townhomes and the condominiums that are coming, are we at now? We're at about 807 uh, total apartments and another 34 uh, townhomes. So I think we're just uh, with what's currently on the books and what's open. Okay. And then we're just under a thousand if you add up what's in the pipeline. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Right. Uh, is there a timeline on development? Do we have a timeline? Sure, I will say that, answer that in two ways. One, when we first started the downtown Westminster project, we always identified somewhere in that 10 to 15 to 20 year timeline, that horizon, knowing full well, certain parcels would be more difficult to develop and certain parcels may, I would say with JC Penney is one that we always knew would be a little bit difficult. We love JC Penney, they're fantastic. I hope that they stay in, in operation. Things will evolve over time. What we identified in the specific plan is to wrap that particular building with a couple of smaller office type projects. That only maintains viability should the JC Benny stay intact. Other sites like the A3 parking lot is an interim usage for now. You know, ultimately that'll redevelop into something different. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, on the really financial projection you gave us, mm -hmm. you have certain years that we're gonna get land sales. And of course, the whole financial uh, projection is based on when those sales occur. Okay, so like, why do you think this year we're going to get $3 million worth of land sales and next year, $10 million worth of land sales? Why do you think that? Sure, so I'm just gonna come right out and apologize that some of the data that was in that uh, spreadsheet that was shared was not current. It was based on earlier projections. So what we'd like to do as staff is refine those numbers, come back with more reality with what we know today, and then refine those looking forward as those numbers start to roll in through the end of the year. So I think we'd like to come back into uh, this board and this council uh, probably sometime in March or April next year. So obviously at one time we did have a timeline and now we're going to revise that timeline and push it out? As all development occurs, uh, nothing is certain. There, it's, it's loaded with risk. Uh, there was something with the COVID pandemic that obviously turned things a little bit sideways from a uh, timeline perspective. Quite frankly, there was also some feedback that we were getting with the, uh, not only the apartments, the number of apartments in the city of Westminster, but also uh, how office was gonna move forward as well. So I think we've taken a strategic pause, like John was saying, with the comp plan coming forward, really refine kind of where we want to go with that, with this council's uh, input as we move forward. Uh. 
And of course, we can change, our, the council can change, I mean, the specific plan anytime it wishes. There are amendments that we can make at any time. In fact, the first one was adopted, I believe it was in 2014 with a quick amendment in 2015. And again, that was after providing, you know, soliciting a number of feedback from our residents, not only in the city of Westminster, but living in downtown as well, to see not only the economics of what we are visioning as a city, but also the residents and how they're impacted with that and the developers and development partners that we've uh, executed development agreements on with the vision of that uh, particular downtown. So it's not just staff, it's all of us collectively making the best decision for those amendments on that specific plan. Uh, right, it's it's just that the timeline on the on the new downtown is uh, as a time deadline because of the URA timeline that started in 2013, mm -hmm. where like the uh, or like the train station has no time clock like that. Yeah, so absolutely. By 2038, if we don't achieve everything we wanted to, that's lost revenue to the city, period. And so we absolutely want to have full alignment with this council, with the development community to go build that downtown model as uh, city manager Mark Freitag was mentioning just a few minutes ago. Uh, how many uh, going to the train station how many residentials are there right now? Because in your section one, I think it was called, you had the core that was two and then three was to the west and one now, and one is mostly apartments right now. So how many apartments and don't we have a contract with someone and then we have a proposal on that just annex land for what, 400 apartments there? So yeah, sorry, Stephanie Ashman, thank you. Um, so right now, um, the majority multifamily owner in that area is Maker Housing. And their newest building has 70 residential units. I'm not sure well, exactly. Well, that was that was really Alto, right? It's... Yes. Yeah. It was formerly Adams County Housing and now they're Maker and they own and operate Alto. So lots of different names there. Um, they also own a couple of the other apartment buildings within that area. I don't have those numbers on how many units are there total, but I could get that information for you and get back to you on that. Um, as far as the other projects that we have under review, um, there's 3551 West 71st Avenue, which is a uh, multifamily 75 unit apartment building. Then we have Lux Living which is the two parcels that surround the RTD parking garage and city owned parking garage, which is 147 units total. And then the Sherman Associates that I brought before you a couple months ago for the annexation comp plan and zoning. We don't have a actual official development plan in for review with them right now. We've gone through a couple of pre-applications. We did go through a pretty long uh, formal process with them and then they pulled out and now they've they're doing some redesigning. Last thing they came to us with was about 270 units. <clears throat> so that's total because I'm sure you want to know the total of what all those are together. Right, you know, because in the presentation you said there was a maximum of 1350 total, right? That's right. Yeah. So we're at 417 units and 923 remaining to be built. Now, that projection Except there's all whole bunch of existing. Yeah. The projection that's in the specific plan district is proposed new development. So some of the idea is with maker housing that's existing property owners within that area is to redevelop with them so that they can provide a uh, better quality type of affordable housing, just like they did with the Alto building that's there, the newer one. So that's that's included in that. So then, the so then in uh, the side, because I think the Sherman property was in the core area, wasn't it? Uh, when it, yes. So three and all of the, the wraparound housing around the, uh, around the parking garage is in the core area. Correct. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of existing as you go up to 72nd in the core area. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So we really need the total of all the existing that's there now, because that'll tell us how many more 
there's room for, right? Well, I know that within the plan, it's proposed new development. So when, when the plan was created and that number was given to us based on the projected numbers for the amount of water that could be provided for the units, that was the proposed new development. So I think the assumption is, is that it took into consideration what was existing of what we were providing and then added the new units. Jump in. I was gonna say that uh, we did assume that there that the existing residential would not be replaced and so it would, that it would remain. So that would be, it was about 1600 units. So okay. I'll build that. Okay, so so we really need exact numbers. Sure, yeah, that. you can get this one. Okay, and then that leaves in the number three unit, there's gonna be no really residential at all there. By what do you mean number three unit? The block, the block, the block, block area. area. Go, back slides. go back to the block area. Oh, for the transitional area? Right. Um, it all depends on how it develops out. So, uh, you know, depending on, you know, what projects come in, there's a vacant parcel in the transitional area right now. That's 3551 and that has <coughs> 70, 75 units. So depending on how parcels get acquired, how uh, land assemblies occur is, you know, and how the market drives those is how those, how the area is going to develop out. So, you know, we have one in the transitional area right now. We have two in the station core number two area, we don't have anything in one. One is where all the existing apartments are. Not all of them, um, but a lot of them. One is where a lot of the commercial area, there's there's commercial, a lot of commercial along 72nd and federal in that area as well. Right. And, there and are federal. some apartments in that area though, too. Okay, so, are there going to be any residentials for one? It's it is it could be part of the um, land use allowed. Yes. Okay. So so is the sixteen hundred number well the limit? The limit is the um, one thousand three hundred and forty new okay. units. And we're guessing there are three hundred existing. Okay. No, that's about okay. Okay. One of the things I'll get was, the numbers. I can definitely find that. Yeah. One of the things I think that's noted is the sanitary sewer capacity limitations on the Little Dry Creek interceptor. So one of the things economic development, community development works with public works, Sarah, um, to update that model to make sure that we're not exceeding capacity. So as new developments come in, we're always refining that model to make sure that that doesn't get exceeded, not only from a water usage, but also how uh, that gets transported downstream. I guess what I'm looking for is, is there a maximum number and can you figure out what that is? Okay, because residential is the biggest user of water because it's sanitary water. And we have a finite supply of that. Okay, so my question is, is, uh, Right now, the hottest property in the market is residential housing. So my question is, why would this other property develop if it's, because I mean, we have in place there that none of the current property owners can make small uh, increases to their use. That if they wanna change their use or upgrade their use, they can't, right? That's, so are you that's my understanding of what's in play. So, Is that incorrect? So, and John could talk to this a little bit as well. Um, so when the property was rezoned, it essentially changed the entire property to specific plan district. What was existing there prior was a lot of industrial uses. There was business, there was commercial, residential. It was a smattering of land uses and zoning within that area. So the specific plan district brought it all under one zoning document. So there's a lot of uses that are currently existing, businesses that are within that area that have existed since before the plan was adopted and now since the plan has been adopted, that we can would consider 
legal, not legal, non-conforming businesses, meaning they can still operate under the new specific plan district zoning for as long as they want to, right? Um, if they were to ever leave their business or like vacate that building within a year, we have a provision. So that building can be vacant for up to a year and have a same use. Let's say if it's a auto body shop, for example, that was there, that left another auto body use can come into that exact same building and operate there. Okay. Cause it's the same type of use and the one year didn't last. Um, another use can also come into there within that one year that's less intensive, what we would consider less intensive. So an example of that would be, let's say, from auto body to like a window tinting or maybe um, uh, tires, tire sales, right, which is less intensive than full auto body. Now we're just doing tires or we're just tint tinting windows. So that's an example of how that use, that similar industrial, light industrial use can keep occurring at the same capacity or less intensive. Now, if you have it expire at a year, then it has to can come into conformance with the plan and the list of adopted land uses that are within this plan. So another automobile shop could not go in at that same location. Does that make, is that clear? Right, right. Okay. And that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. like, like if that auto body shop wanted to, I mean, expand to include the property next to it, that wouldn't be allowed. That's correct. correct. And, and this isn't unique to the specific plan districts. This is a city code provision that applies oh, citywide. Oh no, we just really did that with really with really with like the Episcopal Church. It was vacant for two years. Correct. We had to make a special exception to allow another community type organization to go in there because otherwise it wouldn't revert to the R1. Okay. Uh, and going back to the new downtown. So we're at a thousand units now. So we have 1300 more to go. Do we have lots envisioned for them or they can be on any series of lots there? I would say the shorter answer is there's really only about maybe three different blocks that are going to support a multifamily building. We have a number of those blocks right now that are allocated towards more townhomes, more condos, and a lot of them for office. You know, we'll start to see the mixture of uses. So one of our consultants, Davis Partnerships, helps us to identify the massing studies for each of those lots and blocks so that we can achieve that yield in order to receive some of those uh, those revenues as projected. Well, let me get let me get really specific about how. Uh, about how many acres at the new downtown were actually developable and we could sell? Because uh, it's 103 acres total, but so much went into the parks and the roads and blah, 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 that we only had like 60 acres to sell, right? Yeah, it was actually, I think it might've been just a little bit less than that after we kind of allocate about 18 acres of uh, area for parks. I think another, say 20 acres for rights of way. And there are portions of that 105 acres, like Brunswick owns their land. Um, as well. So there is that number. I'm happy to, I got that exact number down because we've got to report it every year. To so let's just say 55 yeah. is what we had to sell. Mm -hmm. And we've sold how much of it? So we're about 31% of total land area that can be sold, has been sold. So we've sold, so we've sold about <clears throat> 18 acres. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means we have what? Uh, 37 acres left to sell? About that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we, and so far land sales have gotten us $11 million off those 18, right? Yeah, sounds right. Okay. So uh, that means the remaining seven, 37 acres must be sold for significantly higher prices if we're gonna net what, $31 million of land sales from them? So yeah, as we develop, particularly those D blocks, the office ones are absolutely at a premium. And so again, those are projections based on that. Quite frankly, the land sales are such a small piece of the overall revenue picture. We look at some of that spreadsheet we did provide showed 380 some million dollars of revenue to the city. Yep. A lot of that was out of the property tax, out of the general improvement district, retail sales tax, all those different tranches of revenue that come in. The land sales are really that first kind of revenue in the city and then it's gone and never comes back. This is a 300 year development. Never again are we gonna scrape 105 acres and be 
barren dirt. It is absolutely a revenue play like uh, CFO Larry Dorr can attest to. This is why we have invested in this so we can get those long-term uh, rewards and benefits uh, to our community. Well, well, I have a different <laughs> opinion of revenue for us, the city. The only revenue we get is out of retail sales because we charge a sales tax. When it comes to property tax, once we lose the increment, mm -hmm. we're at what? 3.65, like the lowest property tax in the entire metro area, maybe front range. So property tax isn't going to mean anything to us relatively. Relatively correct. And that's why we also have the general improvement district, will, which will uh, reap 100% well, benefit. Well, that's why I'm concerned about the timing of when the office buildings are built, because those, because those will provide the property tax increment. That's why I'm concerned we have, what, 180 square feet of retail out of the 700 that we had envisioned? That sounds about right. Mm -hmm. So it's those other 500 mm -hmm. odd thousand square feet, 500,000 square feet of retail that's going to give us. So that's why I'm so focused on when the office buildings are going to be built and when we're going to get the retail. No, you're spot on. And the other piece for the retail, the other 500,000 to come in is so dependent upon the rooftops or the residential units because it all supports itself. And so we have retailers to say, where are the people? And so we get, you know, it's a mixture of all those uses, bringing in the, the house, the rooftops, the retailers, the office for the daytime traffic, the entertainment, those unique purposes. And that's why with that downtown, you see every use possible on that site because that's where you want that um, energy around all those different uses because they support each other. Okay. Uh, and all the all of the uh, requirements like parking per unit and all that is all in the specific plan, right? Yes, yeah, all that is I did that. That's all designated. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole point of it is that there could be one document that like a potential buyer could look at rather than waiting through our comprehensive plans and building codes and all that all right. wrong. Comp plan, big picture, narrow down those focus areas down to a specific plan district. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Trying to figure out how many of these might have been answered just now versus what I had been written, writing down since you were talking. <laughs> uh, first, I'll start backwards with what I wrote down because you had just mentioned about the rooftop supporting the retail. I want to push back on that a little just because of what we've heard from, I think it was the Laramie Company when they came and they showed us a map that said where the the demand for retail and they showed the map for the demand for retail and where it came from. And I remember right that that demand for retail where the mall once was still exists without the retail being there. So, and, and it didn't just come from rooftops. So I imagine that part of it, but it's not fully from the rooftops in the downtown that that demand is being planned to come from, correct? I agree. It takes both. So, um, I have a couple things written down here, and I think really what would be helpful to not have to hit all of them is I look at um, the slide that is that I've seen a lot of different times that talks about how the 2,300 units, 4,500 residents, how much um, square office space that we want will be very helpful is to know out of what, what you think we could do, what's actually built today, what's slated today, um, and then on retail, what's built versus what's filled so that we know actual vacancy versus um, what the demand is, is really what I'm, I'm curious and, and what's left to build. Um, I know, and this is kind of a, a crossover from the next presentation on the comp plan, one of the things that I would like us to have a serious discussion about is the, the amount of for rent apartments in the downtown. Um, just knowing even to what you had answered one of Councillor Baker's questions about how many units um, of residential are left. I think, you know, I want to make sure that there's the mix between what's for purchase and what's for rent apartment. Um, and to really understand, are we going to go after any more affordable? And if so, how much? where should it be and how many units should it be and what kind of affordable we really want to go after. I imagine that we probably want some sort of component of it, but it should be balanced because um, one of the things that when I look at this hasn't really changed 
um, a couple of years ago when we decided, we heard from the community, community did not like us saying the next urban center, so we pulled that out. But what have we changed in terms of the actual plan to, to match what the community said? Um, I think the community did does understand that there's going to be an urban component to this, but um, I want to make sure that that we're making some adjustments um, that we haven't done to date in my mind. Um, I can't think what else I, I had on, on my head as we were going through this. Um, lead. Is lead, and I may have had this in the questions I sent in for the, the comp plan, I think I did, um, but since it's on here, is that showing to be any kind of barrier when you're when when our people are out looking for um, people to develop in our downtown or our TOD or in the city wide? I think it because it was on my comp plan, but since it's here, I am curious with with the downtown. Um, has that concept uh, been well accepted in the development community? Are we seeing that to be a standard in the region, or is it a, a barrier? No, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. So what we have seen is the lead sewer requirement has not been a, a super high bar. It's not lead platinum, it's not lead gold, it's lead silver. Most of them, quite frankly, can be met by our 2015 adopted building codes, the suite of building codes, so it's not been significantly more for the developers. What we, they've seen, though, is the benefit for, we have long-term operators and owners, and it's not just a single point in time investment, it's the triple bottom line of all of the investment. And so if they're paying less for energy, that's a net profit to their, you know, net on the other side, as well as water consumption, like some of our uh, group 14 did an analysis of the Aspire that you saw that they have utilized 43% less water than they anticipated because of some of the lead silver, uh, not only requirements, but the implementation of those in those units. So we're seeing less water consumption, less energy consumption of those pieces. So the short answer is no, it hasn't been a barrier. We've also had two different developments that we um, put in there, if possible, achieve lead silver. One of those being Alamo Draft House. With a big box, there was just no way that they could uh, uh, achieve lead silver, but they did get lead certified, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, Marzac Fine Food, we'll see. Uh, they're working right, really hard right now because it's an adaptive reuse of an existing building. Uh, we've kind of given, given them some language that says, look, we want you to achieve lead silver, but if it becomes financially a burden or too big of a lift, just we'll get you lead certified. And so we work with each developer on not only their internal desires, because we may have some that come and say, hey, we'd love to go lead gold, lead platinum, because that's part of our corporate DNA. And that's perfectly fine as well. That makes sense. I guess the other the other side of that coin that I'm curious about, because you, and I mean, some of what you just um, answered around affordability would lend to it. And, and the other part of it for me is, um, affordability of the people who are actually going to live there in the future. And so what are we, I mean, the things that you mentioned, I would think would make it more affordable because energy costs are lower, water uh, use is less. Um, but in terms of actual uh, mortgage or rent, are we seeing that have an adverse um, reaction with this level of lead? Or does it look like it's not really affecting um, costs when it comes to the people who actually want to live under rooftops? Yeah, we haven't seen that impact at all. Um, last thing in this, I'm going to shift to the to the TOD. Um, one of the things that I heard, you know, early on, and I've I it just never circled back to me, and it stuck in my head was when we look at some of those other units that exist today, specifically the affordable units that are already existing in the TOD area. There was a concern that I heard early on uh, when this you were looking at a specific plan about those being redeveloped in a way that would push people out who um, call those places home. So do we know any more, like as this has progressed, like what that looks like, or if any of those current property owners that have affordable um, may potentially redevelop in a way that would uh, potentially be adverse in, in making people have to transition out of those homes? That's really good. So early on, that was a conversation we had with Adams County Housing Authority, now Maker. One of the strategies was when they built the Alto building, they wanted to actually move some of the residents from some of the older stock into the newer building and then systematically redevelop one by one so that we didn't get that displacement. Um, that conversation was six years ago now. So I don't know if you guys have had any more recent uh, conversations with 
I have. I've yeah. had a couple. So we've met with them a couple times to discuss some redevelopment of their parcels, but this is where it ends up kind of falling because you have to, whatever residents are living within the units that they want to take down, house them while redeveloping and then bring them back in. So it, it tends to push things off because it, it gets to, difficult to find a place to place people while that's happening. Well, hopefully we continue those conversations and they come up with a creative way because yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, some of that stuff down there is probably pretty old and there would be some benefit to it as long as it's done in such a way where um, people are getting housing that they can afford without being totally pushed out. So I'm glad to hear that at least there's conversation around it. Um, last part of the TOD I'm curious about is um, I have heard from some of the community down there, business community, where they're trying to, and this was in some of my notes, but I think it's probably more appropriate for this, this portion, um, where they might try to sublease out part of their building. And it's been something that they've got pushed back from the city as far as a use that uh, we didn't think is compatible. My, and, you know, so that's one part of it. I, I'm hoping that we're not being so stringent that, you know, people are losing opportunity for businesses that could help them stay in business, especially as part of a market as we're, we've been in for the last two years. And it sounds like it's not going to get any better for at least the next 12 months, um, hopefully not too much longer. Um, but along those same lines, now that we're kind of down this road, is there any thought around um, maybe adjusting the TOD and allowing more of that light industrial to stay because it is still a transit area. You could potentially still have workers who maybe would benefit from certain kind of jobs that would come from downtown and be able to use that, that transit station. So are we, you know, thinking about those things or should we be thinking about those things that maybe, you know, there's ability to further that development in a, in a different way than we originally thought? Yeah, so um, I guess I could answer it in, in two ways. So in the transitional area, we do accommodate for some what we would call the light, light industrial type of uses, um, like the you know small woodworking shops, small welding shops. We've looked at commissary kitchens, things that could be a little bit more on the lines of that. Uh, more lighter industrial type of use that you could work into the transitional area. And so we have padded for that into the plan. When it comes to the existing land uses that are there, and I think I know specifically who you're speaking of, um, you know, I went and I toured his business. I toured the business that wanted to move into his business. And I kind of made sure that it was a compatible match in alignment with the code. And so we were able to, you know, really work it out, which was great because we still have two very creative businesses in that area, which I think is a win. And, um, you know, I think what we're trying to accomplish is we do have some padding. We are allowing for what the code allows us to do with saying, you can have your existing manufacturing business can expand, but where we can accommodate for that flexibility, we will to kind of help these businesses stay. But with the investment that the city has made um, in conjunction with the, you know, investment with the IG, different IGAs and agreements with other um, surrounding municipalities and RTD, we do really want to see some transition that occurs there because we want to reap the benefit of what a rail can bring to our community. You know, it's, we are on an economic advantage in this area by having it this far in this region. So, um, you know, we do what we can to try and work with the businesses that are there, definitely. Um, but we do want to see changeover because that's, um, you know, what we're going for there. We have seen a really great increase in interesting businesses that have been coming in too. So there's been kind of this growth and, uh, photography studios and videography studios and um, art studios and you know music. the music so it's it's been very interesting to see who has been coming and opening up businesses in the area and so I'm I'm really interested in leaning into that as well that's that's good I, and I guess the spirit of all of it to me is um, really the idea of why the city went block to block even in the downtown is 
we don't want to get so stuck in here's what we think today needs to be there that we're not allowing the market to come in with innovative new things because um, I mean think about where we were prior to COVID life has changed a lot things that people are spending their time on uh, they're looking at uh, careers and you know just I think a lot of it is probably a realization how fragile life is in general so um, I want to make sure that we're staying in that same sphere, and it sounds like we are. So I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the presentation. It was good to get an update. Councilor Novella. Um, so I just wanted to mostly give some context around, just for everybody's benefit, um, around just change and redevelopment. Um, you know, if you, we have areas in the region that have redeveloped over time that have been from this working district, kind of similar to the TOD, like Rhino, for example, it's taken 20, 25 years for that area to be what it is today. And so these, you know, when it's market driven, it does, it does take time. And I want just all of us to acknowledge that, um, you know, Rome is not built in a day. And it, it does take when you're working towards a vision, um, you know, and when you're creating a place, it does, it, it's going to take natural progression and it's going to take um, some, some investment, like as it has for, um, for the downtown, for the station area with, all, with the RTD investment. Um, we've seen the orchard change, you know, that built out as a million square foot retail centric area. And now you're, we're seeing it um, you know, 20 years later, almost 15, 20 years later, starting to have more residential um, infilling within it. And that's primarily to help serve the retail. The retail right now, it, it does rely on, on heads, <laughs> on, on households. And so that diversification is really important. Um, we've seen projects like Arista around the um, Broomfield um, Bank One Center, or whatever it's called, First Bank Center, um, that's taken, you know, 10, 15 years to continue to build out. That is not built out, um, you know, like that. Um, so, and we've seen projects that have been built by master developers, um, you know, go into bankruptcy. We saw, you know, Belmar and Lakewood go into bankruptcy with a developer there. We see projects like um, Belmar and Denver Union Station underwritten significantly to up to 50%. Um, to ensure that these projects get built out in public-private partnerships. So these are all, you know, everyone's taking different ways to get there, but these take, these take time, they take investment, and they take purpose. So that's just one thing. And I, you know, when we think about the outcomes that we want to see for the comp plan and the city overall with our water consumption, you know, as we look at, are we, you know, what are we using? Are we being resilient? Are we using too much water? We should be looking holistically at the city, not just, you know, these specific areas. These plans have been done with, as, as uh, Mr. Burke mentioned, significant research and analysis on sewer capacity, on water impacts, and on their, their location in their, their access to transit, access to amenities and services, and their ability to accommodate this amount of density. Um, there are other areas in the city where sure, we can pull back and we should be looking at those areas because we don't have the planning in place. We don't have, in some cases, the infrastructure in place or the access to amenities or transit. So, you know, I want us to think strategically uh, and um, about the outcome we want overall and how to achieve that without detracting from the work that we've put in to getting the places that are successfully positioned to grow um, without impacting those significantly. So that's just a couple of things. Um, one question, you know, to Mr. Baker, uh, to Council Baker's point about um, retail revenues and their perception of those revenues within the downtown and any development area. What percentage now are we looking at with respect to just retail sales outside of retail? Like when we're talking about um, pulling sales revenues from online sales, is, is that really starting to move the needle? 
actually pitch that to Larry Door because I know that like Amazon remittance are probably in the top 10. Sure, it's a very dynamic environment, but if there are 2,300 units and all of those units are receiving deliveries from online retailers, the home becomes a retail, quasi-retail site generating sales tax, right? Because wherever the goods are delivered is where the sales tax is due to the city. So we've had to rethink the, the retail uh, footprint, as you've described. You know, obviously, Amazon is a top, and, and their competitors are top uh, retail sales tax chip generators for our city. Uh, but so to our those residents, those those residential units we once looked upon as a burden in municipal government, right? Requiring service, but not necessarily generating any income due to a low property tax rate. That's also changing. And I think you find that a lot of that is offsetting, you know, in time um, with perhaps actually the growth in residential being more favorable because folks are having food delivered, they're having furniture delivered, they're having all manner of um, clothing, gifts, all kinds of things uh, delivered. So I think both are a pretty dynamic environment. Mr. Burke. That's perfect. Thank you, sir. Can you remind me, are we collecting sales tax revenue um, as part of the, the TIF in addition to the property tax? Yeah, as far as retail sales tax revenue? Are we capturing that within? Yes, yeah, for that for the downtown area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, just another question that came to mind is we talked about how many acres are sold within the downtown. Um, how many are under negotiation? We currently have, I'd say, three more acres in total that are under negotiation right now. Okay. It's a matter of timing. Does that include the office? Yeah. And then I had a question about the TOD real quick. So back in the day, um, it the the industrial slash service uh, the service uses there were really um, doing well. Like, I feel like we had a ninety seven percent occupancy in the businesses. I'm just wondering um, how the you know how the, what's the vacancy rate currently? Like, do we know? I'm not sure we know the vacancy rate. Uh, we we know. Uh, about businesses when the business licenses come in and then uh, potential issues come up like the one Mr. Bott described and we go and work with those businesses. But maybe do you have a perception on what it is? You know, I would say that most of the existing areas, the manufacturing like AEW or um, any of the existing auto or uh, those are still pretty much occupied from what I know from speaking with the owners. And so um, I haven't seen much of a decline and we haven't had to, let's say, uh, deny many business licenses either because I think people are staying. So that's a perception, but we could look at the numbers. Yeah. Just to the point of just understanding, you know, are people mm -hmm. investing in the area because mm -hmm. continue to do well? Mm -hmm. um, okay, one last question. Um, are the new projects coming in going to be joining into the GID? Yeah, for downtown, if they're required to. No, for the TOD area. Uh, so, and <clears throat> when they, any time that they need to utilize on street parking to offset their commercial demand that they can't accommodate for on site, they have to enter into the GID. If they are not and they can accommodate it on the site, then they don't have to enter into, into the GID. And it's a uh, it's, it's like a voluntary basis, right? They say, okay, we would like to use the infrastructure, so we would like to enter into the GID. The Sherman property is already in it. From what I know, there's a good majority of properties that are already in it. We're just not generating much because there's nothing built on it yet. So, okay, once things get built. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Councillor Baker, before I go to you, we have some counselors that haven't spoke yet. So. Good question. To follow up on Councilor Lamella's question on vacancy rate, do we have vacancy rate for the existing residential in downtown? Yeah, we do. In fact, I'm going to look to Moda Shuri. I believe, do you know at the top of your head what the occupancy is on all the units in downtown? 
um, recent units, there were, I believe they were at 90% occupancy right around there for the residents to know as well as the. Yeah. Is fine. Can we get those, all of those vacancy rates? I'm happy to. Yes. Yeah. Because all of them are sitting around 90 95% either leased or occupied. Councilor Evans. Um, so, getting back to Councilor Baker's question about the numbers, I'm just curious why numbers were presented were old um, and not current. It does say April of 2022. I'm just curious, though, how old is old? Yeah, no, again, my apologies. I think we scrambled over the weekend to pull those numbers together, and we didn't do a deep dive to kind of scrub out some of the things. So we're under contract, we assumed. Like there was a big uh, land sale that was scheduled for this year for the office. And obviously that's taken a bit of a pause uh, from contractually where they are. And so that number is now going to have to get pushed out to next year. So there are things like that that we just, you can blame me for not getting into those in more detail before we sent it out. And that's that's fair to an extent. Um, how often do we update these numbers? Because I think it's fair to look yeah. at them often as we are tracking towards completion of the project. So absolutely. Um, back when Councilor Namella was uh, with us in staff, we did this probably quarterly uh, in the downtown. We had staff reductions that we just haven't kept it up to date. We're now building back up and we're going to be doing a deep dive. In fact, starting in January, I think we're meeting every other Tuesday because quite frankly, we were a bit embarrassed as to what was uh, shared. We want to make sure we have those numbers right. And so when we come back to uh, next spring, those will be spot on and we'll be able to have a much deeper dive into each one of those numbers. Um, I will say that um, I know sometimes um, in our departments, they do their own thing, can work in silos. Two weeks ago, we got a retail study um, report and I'm wondering how that plays, how that study plays into the downtown and the TOD, because um, there are key points that in reading it that I had zoned in on. And one of them was being the rooftop discussion. Um, and in it, it said, simply stated that um, adding rooftops may not always guarantee the added net retail space demand. Um, so kind of being counterproductive or counterintuitive of what you just mentioned as far as rooftops being part of the reason why we don't have retail. So it's kind of conflicting reading a report and <laughs> conflicting yeah. it. You see where I'm going? Absolutely. Lindsay Kimball, Economic Development Director, if I could help just add some clarity to that. And I completely understand the question that you're asking. Um, when we look at our retail throughout the city and, and yes, our downtown team and as director made sure we were linked with our business development team to ensure that their input and we're reading and analyzing as that report was being drafted. So we were in sync. Uh, we also reached out to our planning folks as well to make sure we were all in sync. So I just wanted to answer that off the bat. And also to say that um, each one of our sub-market areas in the city are also analyzed, as you saw in the report, on their own, um, just because it is the nature of the location. You know, where you are, who you're drawing, is it mostly um, internal or what's the what's the catchment area for that for that site and that's what the retailers look at so in general terms uh, what our consultant found was that some of our areas were over retailed um, and they needed what they were calling retail pruning which uh, many communities most communities are engaged in right now with the rise of online sales and just change in consumer behaviors as we spoke about we're, we're also reaping the benefits of the online sales through every rooftop is now a point of sale and we're able to collect sales tax there. But um, what may have seemed, um, you know, contradictory in what they wrote is that we do need some, some more rooftops, but it depends on what, what area because of that local draw to the retail center. So there's some areas of our community which might have some older stock of retail offerings or just retail buildings that need some redevelopment or some facade improvements. Etc., um, or just maybe transition to something that's more viable now, maybe more service based, personal services, experiential retail. Um, 
you know, so that's that's where our consultants were going there is that, that it just kind of depends on what submarket of our city are you talking about? Because they're, they're all individual. Okay, that makes sense um, with a little bit more detail and context. So I appreciate that. Sure. Um, but I'm going to lean in again on the study because this now specifically relates to the downtown mm -hmm. and the recommendation saying that the master plan is generally inward focused and lacks the connection piece of the um, of the surrounding built environment. And so that then that then is concerning um, kind of lending to what you just mentioned that surrounding areas need a facade update potentially. Um, and that concerns me that we're strictly focused on downtown and not how to organically bring it all together as holistically speaking um, as part of the city. So I'm just, I, mean, I would just want to understand how you know, we get these reports, we get these studies, we get we get these analytics, which they're incredibly helpful to understand. Um, I think the part that lacks the understanding is then how staff then relates this as part of then the strategic plan, the um, the uh, twenty forty comp plan, the TOD specific plans, um, because I will say that this is one of the better studies that. I've read um, because it was very straightforward. It seemed like it was a deep dive, very detailed into what we should, what they're recommending and what we should focus on. Um, a lot of times that sometimes reading it, it can miss the mark. Um, but I think this one in particular was spot on on the, the detail that they provide in the, in the recommendations. So I don't want this to get lost because I think there's really great pieces that could be involved with both the TOD and our downtown. Thank you. Um, my last question is then how, because um, we could have planning for years and days and months and um, decades, but it could never come to fruition and case in point, the beeline. Um, how much are we, because I've seen it in the TOD and the downtown and in our 2040 plan, how much are we relying on this to help with retail and housing? Because I would like to have a better understanding of how it does not play effect. Because if we never get it, we need to we need to make a plan. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So I'll answer specifically for for downtown. Um, the, the the thing that that E line is going to most positively impact is your office development. Because our big play and sell to that office is that it's highly amenitized, easily accessible for the millennials and Gen Zers who are coming on and working in bioscience and life sciences and high tech that we're trying to recruit there. They want to be able to access through multimodal transportation. So right now we have a big sell in that we've got the pedestrian connection now with the Sheridan underpass to the busiest RTD station bus bus station outside of Union Station. So that's a big sell, but that train station really would, the train connection, rail connection would really be a difference maker for the office component. So it's not so much a driver for retail, but we found that people don't generally jump in the light rail to do retail, but it's very much used to commute to their place of work, if that helps. I understand that. I guess my question really is, have we come up with literally plan B as if we never get retail or excuse me, rail, what does that look like for us for, cause that will change then your office component as far as what we have planned or what we would want. Are we looking at a literally plan B if we have no rail, what's the option? What are we doing to supplement what we thought was going to happen what, and pivot to what we need to do? Sure. So I'll start and I'll turn it over to you, John Burke. Uh, and I would say that um, so the vision of office, a much easier sell with the rail connection. I think specifically, you know, I was trying to respond for, for retail side. 
probably don't have to modify our plan at all, what we were planning to do. I think the office, it just, it makes our job a little harder, honestly, um, because that's a huge amenity and it was a differentiator for our site. However, um, you'll see in our next presentation that we're going to give on the comp plan and how it's informed by changes in office trends and business trends that um, the supply is just limited right now. Um, we are the only thing restraining this market, constraining it, the governor on this market for bioscience is available space. So it's going to happen. Um, I think that with rail, it's a class A plus plus site. Without, it's a class, it's still a class A. Um, but we just, we lose that little um, extra piece of differentiation, which I do hold out hope that we, we can still get. But John, do you have any? Yeah, 100% agree. So a lot of what we're talking to, not only developers, but also the tenants that would occupy those buildings, uh, number one that they're looking for is amenities. So having a nice restaurant they can take their clients to, having a park, having trails, those are huge for the office employee, uh, having events nearby. So on a Friday evening, they see tents popping up. Like, we want to be part of that, having easy access to those things. Uh, mobility to rail specifically is probably third. Uh, the also piece of that is we have the US 36 station with the Flatiron Flyer mm -hmm. that already provides direct access 15 minutes to downtown Denver Union Station. I believe 20 to 25 minutes to Denver to Boulder with a couple stops in between, so you get direct access. So we're already reaping the benefit through the tunnel that uh, Mr. Plass is uh, nearing completion on. So it's one of the components, but it's not a game changer for us. There's enough of amenities and attraction to the downtown. In a in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. On the Denver Boulder market, mm -hmm. that's Westminster. That's downtown Westminster. And so we'll play up all those pieces if we get rail, that, that three mile extension to downtown, that's the icing on the cake. And like I said, that takes us to the A plus plus. Short story, we'll see. Thank you. We lost to Fortune 500s when I was here because we weren't getting the rail. So I know how critical it is. And um, it's a crapshoot. Everything is just going to take time, and there's no guarantees we can give them. Uh, Councillor Baker, and just let me. No, I withdrew. He waved me off. But I just remind you, you get so excited, let people answer, and then ask. So go ahead. Okay. Well, this has to do with what Councillor O'King Nermella brought up is context. Okay. And it's my view that for the city getting into the development business was a huge error. A tremendous error. It was a business we never should have got into. It was a mistake. And I view it was driven by the staff for the genuine concern that this was a better way forward. And they didn't read any of the signals along the way that no, this is a potential future, but that should be undertaken by private enterprise. If this project goes, the way all the rainbows and unicorns and sunshine predicts, we'll still lose $60 million. That's the best result we can come up with. Would any private organization do a project to lose $60 million? Of course not. So why did we do it? Because we bought into this better future? No, this is not a better future. And it puts the city in competition with private people, like on the retail places. We have a report that says we're over retailed, and yet we want to put in half a million more retail stores at the new downtown. You know, if I was a businessman, I think, oh, you know, the city's gonna gonna shift people their way. They're gonna buy us there. I don't want to be in that position, but we're there now. Okay. I want, right now, we don't have any development. We, yeah, we're no longer the new urban center of the Colorado Front Range, but we don't have a plan B. All we can do is hope that these things come to pass. That's why I asked about a timeline. Shouldn't there be some markers along the way that's saying this plan isn't working? 
Do we need to seriously look at an alternative? So yes, absolutely, that is the context. And that's, and that's the inheritance that our council has. Are we just gonna whistle in the wind and hope things go their way? And then two years from now, the new council has all the timeline shift back. Well, that'd be a pretty crummy inheritance to give to the next council. So yeah, we need to think about a negative outcome to all of this and to be told patience, patience, patience. To me, that's not an answer. To me, that's a con. Um, so, you know, we have experts both on staff as well as consultants that are looking at this. Um, they have experience in development. They have experience in the real estate industry and in planning. And so I would hope that we would rely on them versus you know, a feeling of a council member. Um, this takes time. When we were uh, as a city back in 2007, looking at what do we do with this site we had an RFP that went out. We had responses um, then, but with respect to the state of the site, where it did not, and you were involved in this time frame, with the state of the site where there was no land assembly, there were leases and easements and different ownerships. Yeah. So the city went back and, okay, how do we best prepare this site for redevelopment? And that's when the city started to pull together you know, starting in 2009 and took several years to pull together a cohesive site for redevelopment. Then as you, as Mr. Burke went through, we negotiated and I was there for three of them uh, with multiple master developers. It was not free. It was $60 million of art. art it, that's what they were asking for to do one story retail and some townhomes on the site. Real bummer. So when we chose to go in the direction where we had control over what the development would be, we did. And we've gotten some great development on the site. We've made good progress and we're continuing to make progress. And, you know, with the office, for sure, that's something that, you know, I was in negotiations with office, um, with employers. And um, as Mr. Burke mentioned, you know, it is, we have a great location and it is something where we have to just work hard to show them what all the benefits are at the site. And it, it is going to take time, but we were going to be in this, whether we liked it or not for $60 million and the outcome, what was the outcome going to be? It was not going to be the same kind of revenues that we'll pull in even with the GID and continued retail sales. And this is something that goes beyond you know, just this build out. So this is something that brings in money for our community for, for in perpetuity. And we have, because of the block by block nature, have this ability to sell it to different owners. And so we're not reliant on one master developer and their finances or one bank and their finances. I'll tell you, we were negotiating with a, a developer that was since bought out. And now they're pulling out of multiple developments right now. So um, we would have, we, we could have seriously had a master developer just walk away or, you know, put a halt to the efforts on the site. There's no perfect answer. And we, you know, that through the information, just with the retail sales, just let it, letting the market sit there, our mall was dying. It was a big suck on the area. All of the other development in the area suffered. So we had a hole in what our revenues were. And if we didn't change that, we would, it would look like Brook Hill times three. So it takes money to make money. It takes investment to create long-term investment. I don't see this as a con. I see this as intelligent, strategic, and beneficial to the community. And maybe that's because I have some perspective, you may not, um, 
but we are all relying on expertise. I find myself in between all the conversations as I seem to often do. Um, I think just some historical context that's important for the public since we're having the conversation around it is that from what I understand from folks that were here before, such as the mayor, um, the city was very forward thinking in the fact that they had diversified our revenue streams with things like our Walmarts, realizing that the mall was, was going down. Um, and my understanding of the, when we purchased the property was if anything was, nothing was ever done on that site, the plan was to be able to replace that revenue. And, and that's my understanding of what we did as a city, which is, is smart. Um, and everything we've done since then, um, I, and it's hard to throw stones at, if it was me, Dave DeMont, you find yourself in these positions always thinking, you know, what I would do versus what I'm going to vote to do sometimes different things. Um, I'm, I'm not big on the, to Councilor Baker's point, I'm not big on government buying private property and getting in these markets, but I won't say what I would do because I have no idea. I wasn't there. I didn't, didn't see the things in front of me and it's hard to say what I would have, would or wouldn't have done with, with my vote. Um, I will say that I think that there's really fine points about the fact that we're doing block by block because you could, I, I don't see it as a, a zero sum game if things don't happen because of the nature of how it's, we as a city have decided to develop it because we have lost some ones that are disappointing, but <clears throat> there's plenty of other ones that are being successful. Um, do I think it's a good point that it, I think everybody here would agree the more timely this happens, the better so that we do get some of that revenue back out because of um, the TIF. Um, but the other thing that I, I did see in the report or one of the emails or communications we got was that staff heard us about opening it up to other um, um, partners and in, in looking for development. And I think that that's wise of us at this point um, so that we, <coughs> do take advantage of the time we have left in the TIF and see if somebody else could help um, augment the successes that we've had to date and uh, avoid some of the failures we've had. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there because I think some of that context is important. And I do think all of us are, are thinking through this thoughtfully and I think everybody's bringing in some good perspective to the table and hopefully we continue to collaboratively use that as a group and figure out how we move it forward. Just uh, just to not downplay the so public for the public sake, they've heard a lot revenue talk here, right? On revenues, we shouldn't downplay the intangible value gain of this development. There's a lot there that can't be quantified that would that this project also brings um, joy, community, et cetera. There's a lot of needs that our community has that is not revenue based and i would just want everyone to know that that's also a part of this that that's a huge value gain and i fully support this project thank you for your your presentation and i hope you've heard i think you've heard some consensus around some of the issues you know what are the hot buttons and maybe we just need to um in the next year or so get together more often to have those chats make sure we instead of as we're on top of something and we have to do something as we are going strategically just bring us along with it so that there's no surprises and um but i know when i was here before they looked at it as a 20 to 30 year um longevity it wasn't going to pop up anything the next day after we did what we did and it could have stayed dormant for a while. And so, um, I mean, you're right that when it was obvious, there wasn't a developer that had the same vision as this city had. Nobody had done what this city had as a vision. And that was the problem with those, um, at least while I was here with the first two, um, developers that came in, there's just no way we could say yes to them. Um, so anyway, um, I hope this was helpful for you. I think there's more positives than negatives. I think you've heard <coughs> some of the buttons that they just want to hear from you guys, what's happening, 
when the building goes on, what kind of building's going to go on, um, what we're doing with our, our um, business, especially with the, we know that, um, I mean, we can't guarantee a train station and that's been since 2004 <laughs> when we passed that sucker. <laughs> and I've often said, it's, I won't even get my ashes over the rail because it'll never, may never happen. But anyway, um, thank you, thank you. And is there anything else that you think? Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody need a break before we go into the next one? Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> I've heard the craziest Ben story what? that you would enjoy. Greek <laughs> mythology, arachnid. Have you heard that tale? So she was the greatest weaver in the Are there totally the following on. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilors, wanted to uh, start out with uh, just a few comments as we get rolling. Um, I know this uh, uh, comprehensive plan update has uh, a lot of history uh, for some of the the veteran uh, um, members of the council. This is meeting number fourteen. Um, for some of the newer members of the council. This is meeting number five. And so a lot of time, energy, and effort um, invested in this over um, over the past several years. Um, what I will tell you is, is that the last time you sat down with the staff uh, before my arrival on October 3rd, but what the staff was able to do was take what you all, what they heard you all say and put that into the draft um, comprehensive plan update. So this draft version that went out on November 14th and it was posted online on November 23rd. Um, certainly some uh, members of the count or of the community have come, you know, provided comment and certainly reached out to, uh, to you all. Um, we've certainly gotten some feedback um, in the city, uh, but there are really, uh, you know, three options I think that are on the table. Um, number one is, is uh, you don't have to do anything. So uh, our current comprehensive plan is in place. It's been in place since 2013. <coughs> Best practices are that comprehensive plan is updated every 10 years. Um, and so that's why what really drove this one. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we saw fit to, to make some adjustments. Um, and so we're kind of moving forward. But if you don't like where we're at, we can always keep what we currently have. Um, option number two is accept uh, this draft plan as it's currently been written. Uh, and so, you know, that would certainly um, end the meetings or the repetitive meetings. Or option three is, is at the end of this evening, if you have other tweaks that you would like us to do to this uh, comprehensive plan, uh, we can certainly do that. Um, our method um, of how we're planning to do this tonight is, is, you know, first of all, we have a presentation that's going to kind of run you through between October 3rd and this document, how we got here and what it includes based upon your feedback on October 3rd. Um, uh, we are then going to um, ask you for questions. And so if you have questions about, you know, why, um, we can certainly do that. But then the, the really the, the purpose of the meeting, if you aren't satisfied with what you see here, we want to collect on the whiteboard what your recommended revisions are or changes. Um, and so I'll work the whiteboard um, at the end of the table. And what we really need from the council then is, is if you have a recommendation or a change to what you currently have in front of you, um, you know, we're going to put it on the whiteboard and then we're going to ask the council to say, I got you know, four thumbs up or I don't have four thumbs up. And those things that we have four thumbs up on are the things that we're going to go go home and work on or go back to work and work on. Because um, we really want to make sure that we capture uh, council consensus because um, we don't want to, we want it to be absolutely crystal clear where we're heading out of tonight's meeting. 
Um, the last thing that I would just mention is, is that I do think, uh, you know, and this is not a, certainly not a requirement for a, the council, but something that the council ought to think about. And that is, um, you know, if, if we come out of this meeting with recommended changes or things that you want us to go back and rework, we certainly are, are more than capable of doing that. But I would ask the council to agree that those are the things that we want to focus on moving forward. If we come back in several weeks or months from now, and now we have a whole bunch of new issues, you know, then we're, we continue to get caught into this do loop of never ending cycles where, um, you know, we're just never getting there. And so um, I would just ask you to keep that in mind as far as, um, you know, what you have before you, you know, is it appropriate? If it's not, what are the things we need to fix? And then if those are the things that we need to fix, then let's agree that these are the things we're going to work on and get them right. And then we're going to call a victory on the 2040 plan. Okay. So that's what we've got going on tonight. Um, and so I would turn it over to uh, Dave Downing, our community development director, who's got some, uh, some additional folks, Andrew and Lindsay, who are going to help him uh, in the presentation tonight. But Dave, why don't you start us out? I will. Uh, good evening, Dave Downing. Community Development Director here tonight for this presentation, again with Lindsay Kimball, our Economic Development Director, and Andrew Spurgeon, Long Range Planner. Uh, we have supporting cast of characters in the bleachers that uh, we will call upon if necessary. So for tonight's presentation, we're going to review an alternative proposal for the 2040 plan based on the comments received from you folks at the October 3rd study session, which was the last time we were before you with the draft comprehensive plan. We want to seek if council supports the alternative options that will be presented tonight and what your preference is for incorporating those into the plan. And then if council is ready to pursue formal action on the plan. Next slide. So, so staff heard what city council's concerns were at the October 3rd study session. And this feedback is what staff followed to develop an alternative recommendation. We heard your interest in focusing on vacant lands, the need for capacity for employment development and to ensure the plan is responsive to changing industry trends in research and development, biotech, and similar uses. We heard your desire for housing formats that could support home ownership while curtailing further apartment development. We heard your challenge to reduce anticipated citywide water demand. And we heard your interest in improving the document readability, removing relevant content and reducing the overall length of the plan. If council supports the options included in this presentation, you will have greatly curtailed the ability to develop, to develop new multifamily anywhere, but for the two specific plan areas that we discussed earlier, and sites that already have approved multifamily uses, such as uplands. So I, I'd like to ask now, just maybe with a thumbs up, Council, is this a fair summary of what we heard on October 3rd? I get two, I get three, I get four. Very good, thank you for that. Now I'd like for Andrew to walk us through this presentation. And if you would please hold your hold your questions to the end. We'll try to, to go through the presentation quickly. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, as we talked about in uh, when we were here before, we, we spent a lot of time talking uh, mainly on land use, but also our remaining land inventory. Um, and how do we help support council's priorities with those few sites? 
uh, as we've talked about before, about 4.7% of the city is, is all that's left of vacant developable land. Uh, but if you net out the sites that already have working development applications, it's about 2.6% of the city's land area. Uh, and that continues to shrink uh, as new development applications come in. Uh, but we realize council wants to be very careful with the decisions you're making on those sites. And we, we do uh, appreciate that you all want to be good stewards um, of those precious uh, few lands that are available. Um, based on what we heard at the October 3rd study session, um, the, the desire to identify employment lands, um, our department community development uh, teamed up with the economic development department. We met several times actually. Uh, we talked about uh, emerging industry trends and locations that would be good candidates uh, for those type of employment uses uh, that Dave mentioned. Uh, really thinking about um, how you get sort of groupings of these activities together in employment areas, um, where we have the infrastructure that could support those types of uses, uh, both in terms of our transportation system, but also our uh, utility system um, that may have capacity for those. Um, but also being sensitive to our existing neighborhoods, we wouldn't want to bring in, you know, for example, a giant industrial complex in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So really thinking about um, the compatibility with other employment uses, this infrastructure, and then looking at what's around it um, kind of frames the recommendations we'll be presenting to you. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay just for the next slide. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay Kimball, Economic Development Director. Um, as Andrew mentioned, our teams met several times and we brought to the table as the Economic Development Team that perspective of, as I, I heard from this body on October 3rd, um, understanding how does what we're, what we're proposing in this call plan mesh with trends that we're seeing currently is particularly in life sciences, biosciences, um, everything that is Absolutely, the, the strongest growth that we're seeing in an industry is in the life sciences cluster. So that's spot on. And we wanted to bring that to the table in our discussions. And I just wanted to point out, it was very timely as well, because um, JLL annually does one of the most highly regarded um, life sciences research projects um, with um, K, um, K, KPM, um, KPMG, KPMG, sorry. <laughs> Um, and uh, they work together and they do a cluster ranking and a really detailed, excellent report on the life sciences forecast, particularly with a bent towards real estate and how different uh, areas of the country and regions are positioned. So we, I would share with you that within the Denver metro area, that region, which is ranked number 15 life sciences cluster in the nation in the study, um, our North Metro area, and in particular, honing in again on location, 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 the US 36 corridor is the best positioned to um, see the benefits if we can provide the physical space. So in that next quote there, the next bullet, the study found that our region were rich in talent ideas, but we lag in physical infrastructure and funding, indicating a market ripe for growth if given thoughtful development. And I would add development that can help launch, grow, and sustain that cluster. So we've got the smarts, we've got the people, we've got the research going on, um, primarily in the Boulder area, so more Northwest of us. But we also have the great potential to capture that because of our location along the US 36 corridor and all of our wonderful educational institutions in this market we are prime. The only, as I said earlier, the only thing holding us back is the available space. So that's what we brought to this conversation about the comp plan and understanding what type of spaces we would need to be able to capture this. And I'd also like to share for additional color, two weeks ago, I was at the Boulder Valley Real Estate Conference, and there was a great session um, where many um, Northwest Metro Boulder area um, communities were talking about future developments on the horizon to support and capture these life sciences companies as they grow and they graduate up out of their research spaces. Um, and so that was um, incredibly interesting. 
and um, really validated some of the conversations that I've heard amongst this body and of course amongst our own staff internally about the really strong prospects for life sciences. So I just wanted to emphasize that. But again, going back to space available, what kind of space? So obviously the office market is um, not, uh, you know, it's definitely in a low point right now um, across the country. That's not unique to this metro area or the city. Um, but what is doing well, and the only subsection of that market that is predicted to do well are high quality, highly amenitized class A office space with excellent locations and accessibility. So what that's being termed in the real estate market now is a flight to quality. So of, and these are just round numbers, but of the market, of the buildings that have been built or space that has been absorbed in the office category, 56% uh, of it approximately was in this class A highly amenitized space. The rest of the space, so that that was about, that is making up the vast majority, the percentage that that represents of all office space is only about 27%. So it's punching well above where it should be in terms of percentage of space that it's being absorbed and being built. It's being driven exclusively by this class A amenitized space. So I just want to emphasize that obviously directly connects to the downtown conversation that we just had and our potential there, um, but also throughout the entire city. So we need to look at things like in those boxes, you'll see flex industrial vacancy rates are uh, the lowest um, in the metro area and the metro average there is 6.7% and uh, all indications show a strong future projected for those um, flex industrial spaces so that we've worked with our partners in community development through this comp plan analysis of vacant land and where other potential might exist to understand how can we create more opportunities for jobs in this comp plan? How can we say that that's an important value to us as a community and how do we operationalize that through preservation or maybe creation of additional flex industrial opportunities? And again, I'll just direct you to the other bullet there is professional services jobs, which is where bio life sciences and many other um, well paying, those are where the high tech jobs are. Those grew by 8.2% for the region, or that's 24,200 jobs. That's 44% of all jobs created were created by this sector. So that's very significant in both real. So the 24,200 number and the percentage number, it far exceeded its nearest um, competitor for second place for biggest job growth. So again, just emphasizing that potential we have there for quality jobs. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you, Lindsay. Next slide, please. Uh, so the discussions be between our two departments um, were very fruitful and we brought to you um, an alternative proposal as well as some other options that I'll cover in the power PowerPoint tonight. Um, there certainly are opportunities for council either to indicate support for the alternatives or um, perhaps to slice and dice these up into something that you think is uh, supporting uh, the vision for the city. Uh, measured by land area as the the result uh, with the alternative is actually a significant increase in the um, employment areas and reductions in the mixed use activity center, uh, which is the highest water using uh, land use type. Um, both the prior and alternative versions actually did not introduce any new sites for multifamily development. However, we did go back and look at some of the other residential locations and where we could have um, housing formats that support home ownership, single family, townhomes, shared homes, that sort of thing. It's a little tricky because the city can't regulate if housing is, is rented or owner occupied, but we can plan for housing formats um, that would support uh, ownership uh, as opposed to more of a rental community uh, situation. Uh, these interdepartmental discussions also gave us a chance to look back at some of our city owned properties. Um, and what would be the appropriate thing uh, to do with those. And um, this was actually something I didn't expect going into these conversations. We actually 
um, are proposing to change a few of those sites to our public, quasi-public land use, uh, which is kind of a holding category for uh, public type of uses, whether it's uh, municipal facilities or uh, schools or those kind of things. Um, I th the main reason for that is for transparency. If, if the city was to uh, do something with some of the land it owns, uh, there should be an opportunity to talk about that, decide what the use is, and not like sneak it into the comp plan. Um, so that was kind of the thinking um, there. One example is what we call, um, we colloquially call the banana property. It's up adjacent to Circle Point, west of the tracks, next to 36. And it's like, there's so many competing ideas of what to do with it. If we leave it for public and the comp plan, that will allow a council, whether this council or a future council, to have more of a robust discussion on what would be the proper use there. Uh, and not not try to sneak it into the comp plan. Um, overall, if you look at the uh, numbers here, the uh, non-residential uh, aspect increases uh, from 64% to 77% on the vacant land, and then the uh, residential and mixed uses uh, decreases from 36% to 23%. And this in turn would support an anticipated reduction in water demand by 222 acre feet uh, and we did that purely through that interactive online uh, water modeling tool that we provided to council uh, back in June of this year. Next slide, please. Uh, this next this next part, um, we, we weren't sure what to do with this, but we thought council needed to hear this. We we thought we want we should build upon what we heard on o October third because um, there were several concerns that came up. Um, and so the discussion on October 3rd was really on the vacant developable land, but we believed that some of the concerns we heard were actually impactful to locations where we would anticipate redevelopment or infill over time. Um, and the mayor certainly has observed this at the promenade. Um, and so we wanted to, I guess, get these on, on the radar of city council so you all can tell us if if this is something you want to include as we uh, revise the plan, um, these locations that are commercial settings, um, but through the comp plan would, as it is now uh, in 2013, would allow um, higher density residential uses to be introduced into these commercial settings. Um, so these are carryovers from the 2013 plan. Um, and the, the 2013 plan did anticipate that a number of our commercial areas are um, starting to lose their luster and starting to experience some challenges. So um, mm -hmm. introducing uh, more of a mixed use environment, adding residential into commercial areas is, is one strategy to help revitalize these aging commercial areas. Uh, an illustrative map and list of these sites is provided in attachment seven. Again, many of these are functioning retail centers. However, they could allow um, introduction of higher density multifamily uses. And that may be in conflict with uh, some of the concerns uh, that we have heard from city council um, recently. Uh, removing these mixed use designations from the plan uh, would not completely cut off redevelopment or infill potential, but it would allow council case by case to uh, visit those, determine if uh, the proposal is appropriate, and then you would uh, obviously have the opportunity to re-review uh, the water supply impact uh, that would be calculated with any um, proposal that would come before you at a later time for, for redevelopment. Um, changing course on these mixed use sites that we've identified um, in attachment seven actually would save even more water than what we talked about with the vacant land. Uh, this is potentially another 235 acre feet of reduced water demand uh, if we were to include these, which would be 457 acre feet, uh, combining the two categories together. Um, we did identify two uh, publicly owned sites, one of them owned by Colorado Department of Transportation and one owned by actually, to my surprise, the Highland Hills Parks and Recreation District uh, that have mixed use designations. Um, they were not on the list. If council wishes to include those two additional sites, um, the CDOT property is the Wagon Road Park and Ride at 120th and Huron. And then the uh, one owned by the Highland Hills District is actually in the Country Club Plaza Commercial Center at 120th and Federal. Um, adding those would be an additional 50 acre feet of savings. 
um, potentially there, uh, which would be 507 if you're uh, keeping track of, of how those numbers add up together. Um, I will say that curtailing the ability of residential to infill some of these existing commercial areas is a fairly significant poly policy shift from past land planning of the city. Um, and it would potentially remove um, a very large amount of future multifamily uh, from build out of the city. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the more minor changes, again, uh, based on some of the comments we heard at October 3rd. Um, document length, I heard that um, from this body, but I've heard that from even from staff. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we did we did cut it by more than half from 318 down to 154 pages. Um, and the main way to do that uh, was that the plan is organized with with topic based chapters. And so we moved the sort of background narrative um, into a separate um, existing conditions and challenges report uh, that is now attachment nine. Um, so we didn't lose the content. It's just not in this document, which is really the, the, the goals and policies or the teeth of the plan is now in the shorter document and the other um, is just more of a reference or background. Um, this also gave us the opportunity to make sure there any content that was irrelevant or distracting wasn't in the plan. Um, I know um, some of you and, and frankly myself had some bad, bad feelings about some of the data points that were in there that we didn't have confidence in, such as the Denver Regional Council of Government population forecast. So that came out. Uh, we don't need it. Um, we don't believe that number was correct um, in the first place. Um, based on one of the comments at October 3rd, uh, we did um, reorganize the focus and transitorian discussion in chapter two, a little more succinct now uh, to indicate the current condition and then what the future uh, vision is for those locations. Um, and then we did deliver hard copies to you a couple weeks ago. It is very much a working draft. Um, we're certainly aware uh, there's some cross references and some formattings and stuff that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, we just wanted to make sure you got a hard copy in your hands in advance of, of the uh, meeting tonight. Um, but based on the discussion tonight, we're happy to um, move forward with an updated uh, draft. Next slide, please. Uh, so our friends in the Economic Development Department, and in, in, in addition to helping us understand industry trends and some land um, that could help support um, tapping into the emergency, uh, the emerging industry trends, uh, they also um, have, have our housing policy staff um, in their department, and they have been tasked with completing a housing needs assessment. They are looking to the comprehensive plan to help inform what that housing needs assessment is going to do. So they are looking forward to where this plan ends up uh, in its final form. Similarly, uh, work on the Parks Recreation Libraries plan um, is sort of on hold until we understand where the plan is. Uh, the amount of residential development, its location, um, and the type of development will inform what the location of parks, recreation, library services, as well as things like trail connections uh, that go into the PRL document. Um, we can't make assumptions for public land dedication or park development fees if we don't know the amount of residential development um, that's expected. Uh, the separate development code project will implement the comprehensive plan uh, with zoning and building related standards. And so again, final action on the comprehensive plan is needed so we can understand uh, where city council would like to go in terms of future growth and development of the city. And then to implement that, um, take the policy side of the comp plan and then have hard standards um, in, in the development code to implement that. Um, for example, uh, this interest in the employment lands for R&D life science type of uses, that's something that's really not supported with our current family of design standards. So that's something we would need to include. Um, it is important to know that the development code is prospective. So it's forward looking on that two and a half percent of the city that's remaining. Um, it's not a retroactive uh, document um, and it wouldn't apply to the two specific plans that were just presented. 
Um, last year when city council acted not to approve the comp plan, we really slowed down any work on the code. Uh, we really needed to hear where this council wanted to be uh, before we picked up on that effort. Um, again, um, the related concern with, with water conservation, those are really incorporated into the drought management plan and the water efficiency plan. Um, and their rules are in Title Eight, Chapter 7 of Municipal Code, which is a whole um, separate part of city code than what we're working on. Um, things like triggers for uh, drought restrictions. That's the only thing that actually does go retroactive onto existing customers is the drought uh, restrictions, um, should those ever be enacted. Um, and it's really the, the 20 or more years of declining water use that you've seen in presentations from public works and utilities that comes from our indoor um, water habits. Uh, and those are really a function of our plumbing code, which is a whole other um, regulatory document. Uh, so I just wanted to clear that up if there was any confusion about how our codes and the plans uh, work together. Uh, again, as, as Mark alluded to, the desire tonight is to understand where city council would like to go with the plan and the feedback you'd like to offer on the alternatives if you support those or a variation of those um, or any changes we can um, incorporate into a new draft. Um, we will advise you that if you do choose to pr pursue the alternatives that are going to um, move to less intense land uses, lower water using land uses, staff will um, try to meet with the landowners of all of those sites um, to let them know um, what's coming. This is uh, something we think is just appropriate to do. It's good government for us to meet with them. Uh, to be honest with city council, some of those will be difficult conversations and city council will likely hear from property owners that may not be happy if they're giving up something they think they have with the current comp plan. Um, but if that's the, the direction council would like to go with these alternatives, we will facilitate those discussions. Uh, with the holidays coming, it's hard to say exactly how quickly those would occur, but we would you know, get to work on them as soon as we could and try to make that happen. Uh, and then we would come back uh, to city council at a later time, letting you know the result of those and see if you're ready for um, action on the plan. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I do have questions submitted by Councillor DeMott. Uh, I'm sorry, beg my part, beg your pardon. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott, in advance of the meeting, we do have those. We do have some information on those, um, but if you want to go around or whatever the preference is for tonight. He had his hand up first, so he might as well go with his questions. <laughs> well, and I'm sure by now you've at least seen a lot of them are just updates and hearing you tonight. That may just be because you haven't got to that part, like the um, some of the um, the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. The old guiding principles, the new vision was in there, but not the new <coughs> guiding principles. It looked like they didn't match up with our current um, strat plan. Mm -hmm. I was looking at it. So I was trying to understand that if those were based off of the, the current strat plan or were those based off the of old strat plan or are those your own guiding principles? Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, first of all, I see why there's confusion because I went back and looked at that and I was like, oh, yeah, that is confusing. Uh, those are not the strategic plan guiding principles. Uh, the existing comprehensive plan, the 2013 plan, has nine guiding principles. Okay. Um, we, through our public engagement, we, we looked at those and we, we tried to distill those down to the more salient points. Um, and so we actually landed on the four guiding principles um, that are recommended here, thriving city, healthy places, great neighborhoods, managed care. Um, and so they're, they're really not the same as the strategic plan guiding principles. Um, but I was, as I was reading that and I, I understood why, why that could create confusion, um, we could call them something like the four cornerstones or something like that, maybe to remove confusion. Yeah, and I think because for the most part, I don't have any big concerns except for when we start looking at things like there is throughout the plan call outs of things like a prior goal of being the um, leader in national leader in affordable housing, for example. And I think that that can be counterintuitive with the the cutting down on the multifamily, you know, so there's some of that. Um, so some of that cleanup, I think, is is a, probably there. A lot of my other questions are just you can answer them 
I don't think they're they're important for tonight's discussion. They're just more curiosities. Um, I think that probably the biggest concern I had was that um, the next one was, you know, understanding how the cross cutting function function uh, uh, cross cutting topics are functionally applied. Because to me, you know, be honest, to me it seems like a lot of fluff stuff that the city has put an emphasis behind. Um, that are important, but how do they actually fold into planning, such as um, inclusivity? I think inclusivity is important as a city, but how, like, how do you apply that when it comes to a building development? And is that really something that needs to be in the plan, or is that just in there so that everybody feels good about it? And, and, and maybe it still stays in there because everybody wants to make sure that um, the city understands that is a, a priority of ours. Um, but much like the drought management plan, not everything needs to be in here that's a priority to the city. And to me, that just um, adds, um, I just don't understand how that's functionally a part of development, I guess. Okay. Um, that, that helps me understand your question, because you know, when your question came in, I, I, that, that helps. Um, and I think we can relook at that. Um, I, I think the main reason they're in the plan at all is that they were used with the sustainability plan. And so there was meant to be a way you could go between the two plans and see where there's commonality. So there's like a common vocabulary that the plans were using. But that doesn't mean we have to do it. Well, and I guess that makes sense that that's how, um, how it's done. I guess it's just hard when I read it to apply it that way and understand that was the intent. Okay. It, it made it feel like I was having to put every plan through one of those filters. And and uh, and it, you know, I think that if I'm reading it that way, I have to think that at least a, a section of the city is going to read it that way. Um, so I guess that's you know maybe that's just a, a an editorial piece of how you you um, present that in the plan. My my biggest thing that I think we do need to have a discussion around that is actually policy is around the water use. Um, I I like what you guys have done, and I appreciate the hard work put into it. Um, as far as changing some of the, the uses to meet what we've heard from, you know, a couple election cycles is really where I, I see it coming from. Um, and obviously not everybody in the city is going to always agree. That's the nature of humanity. Um, but I do think that there is a, a uh, consistent when it comes to water and, and building against water. And so to me, that, that um, topic needs to be in the front of the book because if you don't got the water, you're not going to build it, or you shouldn't build it. Um, the other big point I wanted to bring up, and I don't know how this works functionally, is um, to not build water against um, projected um, savings and conservancy. And I understand we have trends there, but I would like, even if it's not year to year, but maybe a couple of years out, that we're recalibrating our development against what actual savings are because at some point, what if those drop off? Or the other half of it is if the environment changes in a way that those no longer are uh, helping us in a way that those projections, even if the projections are there, if the water supply drops, um, I just think that we need to um, think about actual savings that are there, you know, in a, in a, a more relative time period. Um, so I wanted to at least bring that as a discussion point because I think that's probably the only thing that really is really sticky for me still is making sure that we're building to water. Yeah, look, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, and I would like to address that because um, for a few months now, I have sensed that it's the conservation piece that is causing apprehension among a lot of people. Um, and, and, I like what you said, Mayor Pro Tem, about, in fact, you took the words right out of our mouth just a couple hours ago. We were all talking about the need to provide at least annual updates to council on the status of uh, the trending of water, the, the trending mm -hmm. of water usage and obviously any changes in our supply, but something that you could use to gauge how the conservation trend that we've been talking about for quite some time is it really happening um you know i think i think there's some fear that 
the word conservation equates somehow to sacrifice. And, uh, and that makes people feel uncomfortable that I'm gonna have to sacrifice something about my current lifestyle that I really like. But on October 3rd, you, Mayor Pro Tem, talked about replacing a couple of fixtures in your house and, and you noticed quickly a water savings because of that. That's not by accident. That's, you can only buy water efficient fixtures anymore. Um, I bought a front loading uh, washing machine. It uses a fraction of the water that the old top loaders did. My clothes still get clean. Uh, there's no sacrifice there. Um, Councilor Numerella talked at least anecdotally about some people she was aware of who moved here from um, out of state, got here and realized this is an arid climate. I'm not going to fight this and uh, decided to put in some kind of low water usage vegetation in their yards, even though we've told you that's only a small piece of what the conservation is all about. Um, we, we have tons of data, not just from Westminster, but from cities all across the country that are showing the same kind of trending in, in conservation. Um, and, and again, getting back to your point, which I think is the most important thing, let's provide at least annual reports. This is why you have a professional staff is to make sure we don't get in, in a trouble so bad that we're beyond the point of no return. Um, I think that's what we would like to propose, regardless of what kind of decision you might make tonight. Um, let's be aware that we are talking about a trend that is hard to define. I can't tell you exactly what kind of usage savings we're going to have in the next year. But let's track that and, and make sure that we notice any variations in the trend that we think is going to happen. And, and I think that's, that would be very helpful and in, in to tie it to the plan, just because that's what we're going to have to um, look at, because that's always a question. Do we have enough water? Any development, this council or prior three, and I'm sure before that, um, but the other the piece of that I really want to tie into, uh, Mr. Downey, is is a actual water supply because then if the environment is changing from under us and we're conserving, Absolutely. we want to make sure that we're mindful of that because even the conservancy then if you know if you have five years or six years of true climate changing the fact of how much water we have, we want to be able to gauge that. And I've certainly heard that concern from the community that. Um, if we build too much or we're not conserving enough and, and the environment changes, it's a real concern in the community. So I feel like if you, you mix those all together in a meaningful way where we're looking at them all, you know, parallel lines, um, I think that that will speak a lot to the concerns across a couple of different constituencies in the conversation. Understood. Yeah, you know, we, we had actually included in the plan a biennial report. We could certainly go annual. Um, but the idea was there's uh, 24 quantitative indicators in the plan. And so we would track those and then we would proactively um, recommend changes to the plan, you know, uh, you know, so we're not just waiting for privately initiated comprehensive plan amendments. We had proposed biennial, uh, so we would have the benefit of the citizen survey results in our biennial um, budget process, but we could certainly do annual if that's what council Honestly, either one works for me as long as it's codified that that's the plan. I think that when you're talking about environment or conservancy, either of them, you're probably not going to see as much year to year as you're probably going to see every other year anyway, but it's still more meaningful than every five years or every six years. And it's and it's intentional, I think, is the um, thing that's more, most important to me is that we're intentionally saying water is that important and that we're matching development against it um, in, in all these different ways that we talk about so often. Let me say one more, just one more thing, just to make it crystal clear here. Uh, I think paraphrasing what Andrew just said, the decision that you make tonight or soon is not a decision that would be beyond the point of no return. Yep. We're never at that point. We could always revisit. We get 
new information that concerns us, we come back and, and revisit the plan. Yep, T totally makes sense. I guess, and to me though, it's still with that point, you don't want to get five years down the road and realize five years ago, we made a really big mistake. That's for sure. <laughs> so that's for sure. Um, there's, there's a farther climb off the ledge sometimes, so. But, but otherwise, I think all the rest of my questions, you probably could um, email back because okay. some, some of them aren't even necessarily relevant. They were just curiosities that were spurred off of all my last week's reading. I appreciate that you, you took a deep dive on it. Thank you. Okay. 50 questions. I'll try, I'll try not to make them 50 questions and I may just send you really smaller later email. So um so I did <clears throat> I liked how you truncated the document overall. I think one place is you're you're refining this a little bit is you could look at examples um two come to mind that are kind of similarly structured is uh four columns recent um comp plan as well as the Denver blueprint. Um they are kind of just the meat and so I think this is close to where we should be. So I like that. Um, I won't get too detailed in this, but bear with me. Um, I was, you know, like, like Mayor Pro Tem said, um, I was kind of looking for water to be a little more upfront in the conversation. So because I'm proud of what we've accomplished as a community, the, the dialogue that we've had the expertise that we've gained over the years. And I'd really love to see that highlighted here that we're being, a, you know, we're not, we may not be a front runner in affordable housing, but we can be a front runner in water and land use. And we have been. And so let's put some fancy stuff around that. Um, then um, I'm just gonna go chapter. I'm just going to go through this. Um, okay, so I'm going to get too detailed into this. I would say on the just a big picture piece on the the focus areas, the graphics are really hard to understand what we're trying to convey. I like you know somebody dropped a bunch of diagrammatic things on them. Um, there's no, you know, the land use is hard. It's visually, they're really small and it's kind of like you look at it. And so if we're going to use a diagram, eh, uh, maybe less on it, less is more. Um, I feel better if you're saying that, that I felt that way. <laughs> if you're saying that, then I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. If we blew them up to full page, as well as making them less busy, would that... Yeah, like think about what you really want to convey in those diagrams. What's important? Is it use? Is it placemaking? Is it scale? And try and, you know, if it's one or two things, or is it connections? I mean, try and maybe narrow it down because I'm not really seeing use in there. And it's a little confusing because all the colors mix with existing uses and then you have other colors. So I would, that, that's just this level of one more pass at them. Um, Uh, there's one piece about the um, the North I-25 gateway, or uh, whatever you call it, um, North I-25 area. Focus area. Focus. Yeah, focus area. Um, we're talking about this setback along Huron, mm -hmm. and really we already blew that away with the most recent um, multifamily that was um, just put right up against Huron. So to be thinking about why we're why we would maintain it when we actually just got, you know, didn't maintain it in the last development that just went in. Um, only thing I would say about, and again, the uses are confusing because I read yellow as residential. Um, just for that, hey, if we can afford to get all of this as office um, and commercial development, great. Um, hopefully that works. I just, you know, I don't know, but um, some level of 
residential may be okay, but especially up in the Orchard Town Center area, and I'm going to come back to that in a second because that was one of the big questions that you had about the commercial centers. Um, I'm trying to get through this or not. So that, that's the focus areas. Um, so we were talking about employment places, and you did mention um, wagon the, the Wagon Road site. I mean, maybe it doesn't happen in this plan horizon, but maybe it happens in another, but it is a great transit location. There are a ton of buses that are in and out of there. So at some point, intensifying the use on that site and could be something really good for that area, uh, particularly because, you know, we're, um, the commercial is so-so along 120th. So I wouldn't necessarily blow opportunity away on Wagon Road. Um, so that's one thought there. Um, I think it would be helpful finally in the Westmore area to highlight where the, the, the runway, the FAA runway zone is the, um, and because when we're looking at this diagram, it's hard to tell, well, why is it all why are we so constrained there? Why do we want to not have residential in particular? Mm -hmm. And so that would be helpful as a context piece. I know you moved all the context away, but you could maybe at least allude to that. Okay. Um, so the, I had a comment about the neighborhood unit. And I think the main thing here is just having some clear parameters for it. It's a little loose, and if we're using it as a criteria, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Councillor, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Are, are, all, are these comments written down? I see something in writing in the margin of your pages as you flip the pages. Uh, you have to turn it into I will what what I'm concerned book. about, and I don't mean to be stealing it's time. Marks. I know. I don't want to do this either. Under is uh, clarity, clarity on the comment and making sure that the rest of council agrees that these are changed. Mm -hmm. So far, I haven't heard anything that seems controversial to me, but uh, I, I'm, I'm searching for clarity here to make sure all of council understands what your comments are and if everybody's or, or at least four of you give us the thumbs up on yes, we we like all of those comments. I mean, we could we we could certainly go back and listen to the tape uh, and try to transcribe this and send the send that to council, I suppose, uh, later on. I uh, help me out, Mark. Do you, do you have a better way of doing of keeping track of this? I can focus in on just. The um, one, the alternatives that you've portrayed. Yes. Um, I can do that. I just did have comments on, you know, there there were. You have good comments. Let's hear them, them. them and then let's see where we're at. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my own running list here. And so there's one or two that I thought maybe would be worth ensuring council is supportive and the others <laughs> are perhaps more perfunctory. But so I'm, I'm keeping a list. Okay. Very good. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. I'm trying to go fast because I'm trying. I know. No, don't go fast. This is important. So take your time and let's listen. I did a similar thing, the list I sent. Yeah. So hopefully if there's other things in my list that you see that need like more discussion that you really bring those up so we do the same thing. But mm -hmm. you don't feel bad. I just got ahead of it because I don't have a job right now. So I finished just at 7 p.m. last night and then I had to decorate the tree or the kids were going to kill me. So. Um, okay, the going into the land use classification, maybe this conversation for you all, um, and maybe, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but we have this uh, allowance in residential low density as well as residential medium density that gives a little extra density. And so for residential low density, we, we say it's 
uh, typically up to three and a half DUs per acre, but they could be allowed up to five DUs per acre based on city council approval um, if there were adjacent areas that were five units per acre, like slightly denser, which is, I, I'm generally okay with that. I, you know, and then we get into the residential median density, which is eight units to the acre, but goes up to 12 units to the acre. And I feel like we're giving away free density. And so I'm, you know, there's, there's context, you know, you're talking about a little bit of the surrounding context or what have you, but um, to me, if we're, if we're giving up free density, I call it that, <laughs> um, you know, what are we getting in return? Are we getting a special project? Are they doing something that is benefiting the surrounding community, their neighbors? Um, because these were just locational reasons, like there's transit nearby or there's, you know, next door, or there's some ADUs to the acre. But I feel like, you know, are they providing workforce options? Are they, you know, for ownership? Are they doing something special? Sure. I, you know, we, we didn't necessarily approach it as, you know, are they going to be doing something special? Uh, although I, I, I hear where you're coming from. I've seen that in, in some other places I work. You know, I think we were coming at it from the, how do we provide options for home ownership um, and the attainable housing um, discussion. Um, the residential R3.5, which is the predominant land use in Westminster, um, doesn't actually reflect how most of our R35 neighborhoods have been built. Um, most of our R35 neighborhoods are closer to five units per acre. Um, Cedar Bridge, Cotton Creek, Countryside, uh, Torrey Peaks, um, Sheridan Green, um, Stratford Lakes, Waverly Acres, Westcliff, Wood Creek, these are all closer to five units per acre. So if 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 where we want to go with the plan is to allow creation of those traditional single family neighborhoods, we thought it would be appropriate to provide that um, increase uh, subject to a council approval. It would require a council approval. It's not an automatic thing. Um, so that's really where we were coming from. We, we removed, there used to be a separate R5 category. We only have one of those in the entire city, Tuscany Trails. Uh, it seems silly to me. Why do we have a latest category just for one place? Um, so we could just take our, our existing one and, and provide that extra, extra flexibility. Um, so that was the reasoning on the residential low. The residential medium uh, could be worth more of a pause and see if that's the direction we want to go. Um, we've heard from people that try to develop um, a townhome type product that about 12 units per acre is a sweet spot. Our eight unit per acre is a little low. Um, and similar to the R35, most of our, the, the older townhome communities, um, I'm thinking of the kind of things you see on 88th uh, and 90th Avenue, just west of Wadsworth. Um, for the, a long time, the city had a zoning standard that was 10 units per acre. So most of those are developed at what would be an R10, even though we don't have an R10. So again, we're looking at how can we replicate the level of density that was historically built um, in our suburban area. Um, so that was really the thinking. We, we didn't approach it from, should they provide something extra? Um, but if that's something else we'd like to do, you know, that's a discussion we can have. Did you guys want to talk about it or should I? Go ahead. I, I, I like giving that flexibility because then that keeps them from having to come before us for every little, okay, we're at three, you know, 3.8, 3.9, 4.0, and we don't have to slow that process down. So. I agree. I guess the thing that maybe would have avoided the conversation is the context being in the, mm -hmm. yeah. the document mm -hmm. so that, because if she doesn't understand it, I sure as hell am not going to understand <laughs> it. So, if, however you could encapsulate that so that it's understood. But mm -hmm. I mean, but what you just explained makes a lot of sense, especially thinking through the ones that, that you pointed out in my head. I can, you know, I can visualize the way that those developments are and you're, and you're right, but the flexibility is nice, so. Right. 
Yeah, um, giving those neighborhoods, I mean, we've walked every one of them, so we, we get it. And I live in one of them, so does most everybody here. So um, no idea it was supposed to be a 3.5 and it's a five. Um, but I know what we have. Or something. In your so case. it doesn't yeah. seem so horrible. <laughs> 4.8 so, wood. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd rather have that than being in the middle of a commercial zone trying to live with kids in an apartment. So we're we are you, do you agree with all that? Um, yeah, I was just, you know me, I'm the most annoying person. So you know, I would just I, I always try and find ways where you can get more out of uh, development, and so that is in just higher quality. So I feel like we give a little bit of leverage away with it. I mean, maybe there could be a little something added in there to, you know, be more kind to yourself too. I think from a textual, <laughs> if I could, Mayor, I think from a textual standpoint, um, just providing some examples um, really help to clarify that. I think that's really what um, what the council is getting at is is that you know the the range for the densities is you know is is okay because it gives options, but to give some contextual example to that would be helpful for the reader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. You said that, you know, in some of the draft documents we used with the public, we did include examples. Um, so it would be very easy just to drop those names back in. Yeah, sure. Okay. Anyone but, else? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, isn't on the neighborhoods they use the gross acres? So they added in all the roads and streets and parks and everything else. And isn't that why a 3.5 is more like five? Uh, uh, what you said is correct, but um, I I actually pulled the old PDPs going back into the 70s when some of these neighborhoods had planned. I know they were at four or five units per gross acre then. So, 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 how did that so the net, it? well, that was, Prior to a comp. we didn't have a comp plan in place then. We, we, I mean, our yard's plenty big. We have one, yeah, one the, on a corner that can I, build another house I don't I don't know the city's full zoning history. My my observation when I looked at these neighborhoods is that a lot size of about six thousand square feet appeared to be typical. Um and that's less than uh when we started doing our more recent comp plans, the R three five moved to a seven thousand square foot lot. But six uh in places like countryside and Sheridan Green six six and change appeared to be the common um format used in westminster well then do we want to change the standard i don't understand what you're asking so so low uh, so low density residential instead of being what 2.5 to 3.5 3.5 to 5 currently well, it's 3.5 to 5, then. So what's the problem? <laughs> there is, there is well, if it was if it was kept at 3.5 only, then we wouldn't be able to build future countrysides or Sheridan Greens. Uh, but allowing them to go up to 5 allows us to better replicate that type of uh, single family. And that's what we have in the plan now. That's what's in the proposed plan. plan. That's not in the current plan. Well, it's not in the current. What's in the current plan? You have to be 7,000 square foot, three, five units per acre. Okay. So in other words, well, the current plan is 2.5 to 3.5. Gotcha. So this makes low density a little bit more. It, yes, to the extent that it would. Because, it would because make, this plan has redefined quite a few categories from what was in the other plan. Yes. Because I have one water use sheet that became obsolete because we made new terms in this one, which was somewhat frustrating. Okay, I have some specific well, questions. Wait, wait, she, Sarah's not oh, done. Sorry. We're just talking about this one piece. So sorry. are you okay with what's being proposed? 3.5 to 5. Yeah. And, and 8 to 12. 12. Ms. Emmons, the medium density. That's the low density, 3.5 to 5. Right. The low, and then 8 as well is the medium. Yes, sir. Uh, can I just have a question? Um, 
to the idea of this range, um, and Councillor Nermella, your your original suggestion about um, the higher end of the range perhaps being tied to certain conditions, wouldn't the range be a city council decision? So if there was an application coming forward and it was within, you know, between three and five, it would be up to city council whether that landed at the higher end of the range or not. And that would be dependent on the, the individual application, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's just that the eight to 12 was just a little more specific as to what those conditions might be because they're actually yeah. kind of spelled out. And so one of them didn't say you're, I don't know, doing workforce housing or doing, you know, some improvement to the surrounding neighborhood or I, whatever. That's not in I, here. I at took all. the eight to 12 being more like the townhomes, like you were saying that kind of thing and at our meeting um in jeffco last week they they weren't talking multi-story they were talking more doing it um a, more attached like 12 um homes or duplexes by six or whatever but anyway so are you okay with the eight to 12. i am i was just you know Okay. Is, do I hear any nays on the 8 to 12? And do I hear any nays for the 3 to 5? You've got to go. Okay, thank you. Okay. I didn't think it was bad. I was just, you know, trying to get something. Um, okay, the, the next question I had was about the, for suburban multifamily and urban multifamily, um, it's just the minimum lot size. Mm -hmm. I was thinking in, um, for the suburban multifamily, because it includes townhome scale development, we have a minimum two and a half gross acres for multifamily. And I just thought, I don't know, there might be some smaller info. We have a lot of these weird sites in the uh, city that probably aren't two and a half, but we, you know, that might want to go up above 12 because, you know, and go in between that 12 and 18. Yeah, I appreciate that. I anticipated this coming up at some point. Um, the the reason that went in um, was actually uh, directly as a result of some citizen comments we got at, at a meeting we had in historic Westminster. And there, there was, uh, I think it meant, I think it was actually the late Bev Capra, uh, who who pulled me aside and um, told me observations she had made about things she was seeing in Denver that she was scared was going to creep northward um, into historic Westminster. Uh, the slot home uh, type of development. And so um, we put this in there, the minimum size for multifamily uses, um, looking at uh, sites we have in Westminster and what we thought was like the minimum size to make something work and meet um, our general requirements. Um, the definition of the glossary appendix B defines multifamily as five or more units on a lot. So this wouldn't apply to townhomes or uh, single family paired kind of homes. It would apply to those multiple units on a single lot apartment type buildings. And so um, that's a nuance Where's there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did think five acres minimum for urban multifamily was big because if you look at even the downtown site or some of our blocks in Westminster Station. Now, granted, those are already zoned, but those are definitely smaller than those are like three acre sites. So I was just curious why we picked five for that. Yeah, I think, you know, I think once we leave the focus areas, then, you know, we get into a lot more concern for compatibility with, with the uh, built environment around it. Um, we, we as staff really struggled with the St. Mark Village, um, which was an R36, uh, that was actually six acres. And to meet parking and stormwater and landscaping, it was very squeezed. They came to council, I believe, with a dozen or more exceptions. So we we really th were thinking, you know, outside of the focus areas in our more suburban parts of the city that five acres or even six is even is a challenge. So we wouldn't want to go smaller. St. Mark's has, they have to have signs at wishbone so that wishbone people have a place to park and if you're down there 
both sides of Wishbone then on the side street, people have to walk into St. Mark's because there is not enough. That was a, that was a missed mark. Yeah, a downtown, fortunately, this is, you know, there's structured parking and those investments made um, outside of there. We, we have people that do surface parking, which of course needs land and, and that's where things really start getting squeezed. Okay. Um, to, uh, so I'm just going to hit the land use map in relation to the questions that you had. Um, so, okay. So for the alternatives that you suggested, um, the location of you went from commercial to service commercial over at Huron and 136. Wasn't so thrilled with that. I'm trying to understand if it's a portion of the site or the whole site, but it's also the portion where you have the S map, the service portion map is actually adjacent to a school. And in our land use description, um, you specifically say that, you know, location of service commercial use is adjacent to schools and other sensitive uses and public quasi public um, is not encouraged, but we're mapping that. And at the same time, we're also mapping another service commercial use next to the new arts school over off of church ranch. And so um, we, we, we don't like that. We've got a spirit of debate and staff about these. Uh, so um, I'll start with the, the one near 136 in Huron. Um, I call it the U-Haul property because that's who owns it. But yeah, I had to look that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I'm going U-Haul. <laughs> uh, I think if you go to the assessor, it says, you know, it says like XYZ LLC out of Phoenix. But if you look at the address, you match it up and it's it's U-Haul. Interesting. They bought it at auction from what I understand when they learned that doing their typical U-Haul use wouldn't work. They've been trying to unload the property ever since then. And wouldn't that be a service commercial use? For the entire um, uh, 10 acres, uh, however much. So we were proposing, or I'm sorry, that's more like uh, 22 acres. Uh, we were proposing um, to lock off roughly the southern eight and a half uh, for a service commercial use, keeping the um, the non-service commercial along here on, we have the sales tax sharing agreement with Thornton. We need to make sure sales tax generation occurs in that area, but giving them kind of a break on that back part of the property. To the south is the uh, Big Dry Creek um, wastewater treatment plant. Oh, okay. Right. right, so that's not the school. That's right. Yeah, uh, I was thinking the mountain. So we actually thought that was an okay use next to uh, there, but okay. yeah, I take that back. Yes, <laughs> agreed. This was, you know, kids hovering over me telling me to decorate. <laughs> no, I understand. That's that's uh, um, the other one, though, is uh, you know, we've kind of struggled with you know, church ranch is a focus area, but it, it sort of has different personalities depending on where you are in that area. Um, there was uh, combined about 11 and a half acres uh, that would lend itself to employment development. Um, but the Doral Academy is pursuing a charter school, as you noticed, um, on a 7.2 acres. Um, that really, we believe, is going to take um, some of the momentum out of further employment area right, right around that area. The, um, you, know, you don't really have for that four acres that's remaining. It's like, what do you do with the four acres that's left if the school's taking the big chunk of it? It doesn't have highway visibility, um, and there's not there's not really good synergy with the other things around it. So we were recommending the service commercial use. Uh, it's away from the single family neighborhoods. It's on Church Ranch Boulevard at a stoplight intersection. So we we just we thought that could be a good candidate for service commercial use, which also was a very low water, one of our lowest water using land uses. 
And that, that's on the corner off of Doral Academy then, where that light is? So, yeah, southeast corner of Church Ranch and West Coast Park. Park. I'm so mad in love with that. Like having it right next to a school, I'd rather just see commercial there. Um, there is some flexibility with, instead of just going straight to service commercial, I mean, commercial does have a little bit of flexibility with it where you could play with it versus just kind of saying, yeah. here, come put a whatever, auto use right in front of a. Yeah, our, our group discussion landed on the service commercial, but you know, the council as a group wants to do something different. Um, we we just thought we you know the Walnut Creek is very well retailed, um, but there's not a lot of opportunities for those auto um, uses to to locate in the area. And, and the school chose to put themselves a half block off of a high volume street. I talked to Doral about it. If, if you guys are okay, that I just I don't like it. Or else you go to one of the closing Jeffco school sites. Yeah. <laughs> Had they known? Right Had they shiny known? Penny. Um, sure. Okay. Um, so Do we need to check if other people have concerns over that site. I guess I'm the only. Okay, you know how I am. I high. I have very look, high standards. My yes, it did. <laughs> I didn't change my mind. I just, just kind of gave we, up. We might as well just check it out. Well, do you, do you want it or no? I don't want service commercial right next to us. So should we then just do the full or? That's what I just did. With no? <laughs> and nobody had other concerns. So she's the only one. The only one. Doral, you heard me. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, let's see. So. Big picture with the retail, the, some of the mixed use commercial sites going to just commercial. Um, I do have a concern about, well, then what? You know, we're talking about the retail strategy, um, you know, having to prune retail and then instead of allowing for a little more flexibility on some of our um, older, less exciting, um, less active uh, retail centers that were kind of pulling back on that. And um, I would say probably there's a balance that can be found where, you know, for instance, you know, the ones that have been actively moving toward intensifying, working on rebuilding, like I look at Orchard Town Center and that I feel like is in a is going in a good direction. I wouldn't want to just quash um, what's happening there, particularly because we're trying to attract office and employment. So to be thinking about the bigger context and picture about where we pull the opportunity away from and where we maintain it. And so that's a place where I probably wouldn't. Um, there might be other areas where we're like, okay, we'll accept that this is going to stay stagnant for a while longer. That, and that's just so it is one at 128. Yeah. Yeah. Or, so exciting before. Orchard Town <laughs> Center is a little bit challenging because um, it's you know it's it's a it's a such a nice environment to to go spend some time in. Uh, the North Huron Interceptor uh, does not have capacity for more high density residential uses in that area. Um, but and that's the new interceptor that mm -hmm. the URA is funding. So we actually kind of thought that was low hanging fruit to take away the mixed use there because they're, they're just not a way to sewer okay. more multifamily. Okay. Is there any, no townhome or anything in there? Um, you know, we, the sewer bottling is done, you know, as a whole base and, and assumptions about how it'll develop. But basically, whether at Orchard Town Center or one of the other properties in there, one very sewer intensive use basically would limit the other properties to develop. Uh, and so there's kind of a fairness thing. So if we keep everybody kind of at a lower, lower water, lower indoor water use, sort of equates to a lower sewer use. Uh, so that was the thinking up there. Okay, I, you know, it's just perhaps 
what I would like to hear from staff before we say, oh yeah, cut it all, make all these changes, is just an evaluation of, is there a place where, you know, the, the, the mixed use is actually going to help the area versus hurt it overall? Like if we don't have a lot of options for what we're gonna do with the commercial center. Um, you know, I, I do worry about some of them going pretty stagnant. Um, and so I don't want to, again, kill off opportunity where, you know, if we could survive with letting that one continue, like one or two of them continue, um, I'd like us to think strategically about it before just saying carte blanche, let's just take it all. Um, and that's for the retail commercial. Yeah, I I guess we do, we we would need help from council identifying which of those were desired to be kept for mixed use versus which ones not. Um, I, you know, out of fairness, we were kind of putting them all out there. Yeah. Um, but if there's if council has priorities, we could talk about that. Um, I guess my thought was, if we lower them all, and then there is a t future time for redevelopment, they could come back and ask for a land use change at that time, we could reevaluate water or sewer or traffic or whatever the other impacts are and, and let council um, decide at that time if, if that was in alignment with the vision. What they're trying to work with, I think that's what you're proposing is the fairest so everybody can get something. Okay, I know the next thing is to talk to property owners who may not. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, those, there's going to be some difficult um, conversations. Well, if I may, those are conversations they then bring to planning commission and then they mm -hmm. come to us too. Mm -hmm. At that time, we can evaluate that in the balance of where we're at at that time. Yeah, I would, you know, just look at which ones have the best opportunity to drive other retail commercial activity in our city. Um, and which ones are you know really suffering right now? And we have all heard from community members of, um, about their concerns about some of our failing retail centers. And so, are we hearing them, reflecting them? If we're kind of just saying, okay, well, we hear you, but you know, it's going to stay where it is. So I would just like to have a little more, yeah backing behind some of those. I mean, if, if there are any that are really high vacancy, that might be helpful to know versus others. Um, you know, are there sicker <laughs> locations than others that we need to attend to? I think we're going to get a lot of that out of the public, out of the public comments and the meetings that you know we've got going on. So you're going to hear some of those uh, opportunities rise, you know, to the top. And I think then that's, those are those adjustments that you make. So just, you know, it's, it's start on an even level and see what rises to the top or, you know, spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out what's, what people are going to support and what people aren't going to support. And I'm not so sure we have that knowledge right now. I think that's really where the public input plays in. I, I would mention there's two sites that we didn't include because of some vested property rights they have. Um, so. Yeah. And can, while we're on the North Huron and, and the Orchard, when does our agreement with Horton run out with shared taxes? May 6, May 7. I know the URA is 28, but I don't know about the sales tax. It's all between 26 and 28. Mm -hmm. I just think it's coming close. Yeah, yes, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. Just, I'm sorry, I just didn't know. I couldn't remember the date that it was. Not a biggie. Okay. Anything else, ma'am? Of course. Um, the employment lands that were expanding, um, you know, I, I uh, Director Kimball, you gave. A, um, a, a good intro of what you know the thinking was behind identifying some of those sites. Um, they've, you know, they've certainly sat there for a really long time, and you know, just I'm 
dubious about some of the potential on them. Um, so there's there's that, and that was one of my questions for you all, and kind of answered it in some ways of talking about the potential for employment, but I'm also skeptical. Um, and then I think what I also was skeptical over was the um, the public quasi public designations for the uses that are um, the, the banana parcel. <laughs> You'd think after all these years, we'd have come up with a better name for it, but. It, it stuck. <laughs> Bad bananas. Well, it's it's, 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 it's the shape of it. What are you gonna do? Um, and ha does RTD not need it? It was originally because of Northwest yeah, Rail. Right. Going like to, because facility. Boulder didn't want it. We right. said we would give that to them for the rail facility. Are we positive? We do not need that in case we get rail. We are not positive for that. Okay. At least not until 2046. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> to hold it. Right. So that was that's what the public, quasi-public designation would do. It would keep it into a public use, whether it was a city, RTD, CDI. Some future rail authority that hasn't been created yet. I mean, if if to get the rail and Boulder just fought it, and we had to have a maintenance, and so we talked, and that council said we can designate that area. Right. Um, so that would that was our recommendation was the public quasi public for the uh, you know, nineteen point eight acres uh, with any land use. Um, there's currently no sewer connection there, so it's very hard to develop for much of anything. And the shape of the parcel doesn't lend itself to meeting fire code requirements for multiple points of uh, egress. So it's it's a really tricky property, and we just thought if it was public, quasi-public, then that means you know it's a municipal use. And then when the time comes, we can decide does it go to RTD or does it become something. All the apartments that are over there, they need a big dog park, and it could you be used as that for the for the meantime. True, oh, it wasn't as uh, the other one that I thought we were proposing, but I can't see it on the map. Is the one next to the West End? Mm -hmm. The city-owned property south of the West End. Yeah, yeah, that was that was another one we kind of struggled with the staff, and we landed on a public quasi-public use for that. That one was the more puzzling one for me because I know we've been trying to sell it and that really doesn't quite sell it. When we're like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if I could, um, some of our, our conversation was around the last time this had come up, I know this council had wanted to discuss future visioning for that site. So we also saw that as a more flexible placeholder for it for now, or to lend itself to more of a cultural use that would be compatible to city park just adjacent and some of the other uses around there. Additionally, looking at what's the future for the Butterfly Pavilion property. And I, I, I just heard at that last conversation, maybe there was some visioning around a cultural quasi-public use for that site. So that was our Well, I would love to see it be a cultural use. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and then, let me just see if I had anything else that's substantial. Can I give you my other random Please. comments? Yeah. I think like I can't read this. <laughs> Are you my readers? <laughs> well, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't even read it. Yeah. Um, let me just make sure. I can... <laughs> Literally, yeah. this. I mean, is it even, I said, is this 508 complaint? <laughs> I said it too. So 508 complaint, good. We have to difficult to read, it. and I don't even have old eyes. You guys hey, 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 hey. Two months. <laughs> right. Well, the, the older eyes. I'm sorry, but this has been the same since we got it last time, as far as it's difficult to oh. read. <laughs> I'm sorry, is, so it the, is the font size or it's the color? I'm sorry, gray on white is awful. Yeah. Awful. It's, it's like, the, 
It's okay. So whatever. Just so you know, serif fonts are easier to read. Division division standard, but I read that in a dark garage, and I have old eyes, so I don't know. What do you that's, mean? That's below a, or something? That's an easy fix. That's, that's yeah. easy fix. Yeah, I mean, like this. Pretty blue. That's fine. <laughs> okay, it's really the it's 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 a little close together. It's the the letting both horizontal and vertical. If you really must know. I was going to make that a comment in my email, <laughs> but since <laughs> Councilor Emmons color, brought that up, you make it was a choice. No, Montserrat should only be used for the part of the South. You can work that. Those are easy choices. <laughs> um, so, one thing I in the economic um, development piece, I didn't see anything about. Um, we talk about supporting and enhancing retail centers, but nothing about just working with them to um, refurbish or in, um, you know, do improvements. Um, so just working proactively to do that. So I didn't see a policy around that. Um, so, um, Councilor Nermilla, I, I would say um, promote redevelopment of those targeted areas. And so we were trying to come at it more from a redevelopment and the redevelopment toolkit that we're gonna be bringing forward in the next year. We just quashed redevelopment for many of these. I mean, unless you're trying to just say we're commercial retail redevelopment. I mean, that like was. for like. Well, particularly I mean, in I mean, the TOD area, it's where we were focused on. We have, we have policy 4.1, but I, I think if I'm hearing you, that could be a little more broadly um, to talk about, you know, revitalization and refurbishing. Yeah, because this is the infill and redevelopment. And I thought with what we just did um, in the proposed version, we're not really allowing for 4.1 to occur as much. Um, um, not with residential. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing was uh, for the fiscal piece, there wasn't much about, one, I thought we already had a fiscal model created, but this says we should develop a model. I thought Tischler by created a model for us. They they modeled the citywide comprehensive plan. I, I think what we were asking for here is that, so when we, when we come to council in the future with individual land yeah. exchanges, there's a fiscal, um, there's a way to present quickly uh, fiscal impact with those. Okay, I thought they were providing you that, but okay. Um, and then the other thing was- They would, but they want to charge more for it. <laughs> got it. Um, the one thing I've brought up a couple of times is just in our budgeting and just the way that we're looking at infrastructure, I didn't really see any place where we're talking about planning for replacement or renovations um, for our facilities. And that to me, I thought should be at least acknowledged in the plan when we're talking about how we're planning for the future. There, there was a piece of that, I believe that came out and into that separate standalone document, but we can relook at that. Okay. That was one of my questions because we, how, how many years have you been talking about the court? Mm -hmm. um, we've got to do something and we've got to take action. And what kind of plan does each one of our buildings have so that we know when boilers are going, we know when furnaces are going, we know when roofs have to be done, all of those things. Where's a master plan that we're taking care of? So. Facilities maintenance and replacement financing master plan or something like that. Maybe that's. Yeah. You know, the general services was pretty active in the plan, but I, I don't recall a, a deep discussion on that, but we did have some language um, thinking broadly about, you know, the system of utilities, streets, drainage, et cetera. Uh, and I believe that got, that was some of the language that went to that separate document to shorten. This I, one. I did see stuff about utilities and infrastructure, which is different to me than mm -hmm. the courthouse, the buildings that house the work that we're doing. City facilities. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. And we can look at, 
I haven't had my capital improvement plan brief yet and, and how we do that and what that looks like over five years. And so certainly something that was a lesson learned in Janesville previously. And so we'll certainly take a look at that because that's one of those that if you don't stay on top of it, you don't have a plan, um, you fall behind and then you can't catch up. So I And we've that. been talking about the court since 2012. Yep. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. We we have a consensus of including. Um, all right, one last slightly picky thing. The neighborhood <clears throat> unit with the, the 20 minute walk and bike. Mm -hmm. A 20 minute bike ride to me doesn't seem like a neighborhood situation. So I would just quit saying that and just focus it on the 20 minute walk. And then you want people to bike. Ride your bike. But a 20, 20 minute bike ride could be like, Depends on the ride. Um, You're not seeing me ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> you will never see me ride them. Um, okay. And my last, aside from the big one, was the measures that you would be coming back to on a biannual basis. And I, there were a few things where I thought, um, have we thought about what, what actually defines success for our community and how do we, how are we actually measuring that? Um, there were things like in the transportation and mobility, you know, are we, are we, when we're talking about safety, are we looking at the number of crashes? Have those reduced? Why isn't that something that we're looking at? Or bike lanes, like the number of miles um, that we have. And there may be other things like trail connections or what have you. So that was just this other layer of just real finite numbers that I think would actually signify, hey, we're making progress and would give the community too something to track. And I would love to see that we have less crashes. Um, <laughs> there's Can I piggyback on that real yeah. quick. Yeah. On the I think on the like bike lanes and stuff too. Like I I would be curious some some way to measure whether or not they're going to be used, whether or not you're seeing like you do like traffic studies. So like I know I, I harped on a lot 100th Avenue and Sims and the changes in those. So it would be it would be valuable to me to be able to know whether or not there's there's being use in all the places that we've added bike lanes, decreased car lanes on, on the other end of it. Not just are we adding bike lanes, but are they actually being utilized? Because we, we do have to maintain those. Mm -hmm. So I mean, say for example, you cut down a four lane road to two lanes and you added bike lanes, but the bike lanes aren't being used, but the car lanes are actually sufficient for what they're being used. That's real dollars in, in asphalt every time you have to go and replace that, that road. So I think that there's some value in understanding whether or not we hit the mark with where we put, put the bike lanes. Or you increase the number of really mad middle school parents. <laughs> I am, and definitely I am sensitive to that being one of those mad middle school parents. Um, just a few other suggestions. Um, in the health, wellness, and community services section, uh, you know, are we looking at air quality, um, food access, how many people, for instance, might have access to a grocery within a certain distance? Um, these are some of the, you can look at, um, you know, Denver has some great measures that they <coughs> utilize to look at um, health and well-being. Um, are we looking at homeless number, homelessness number, you know, numbers of people experiencing homelessness? Um, are we looking at a portion of community, of our community that's in poverty? Or on the other side of that, household incomes, are they increasing? Is our educational attainment increasing? All of these things, I think, would signify that the work we're doing is actually, you know, actually helping our community have greater resilience. Um, on the other side of household incomes, you could look at how many of our residents are cost burdened or house burdened. So there's that. When it comes to economic and financial resilience, um, you know, I'd love to see something like, you know, the number of primary employment jobs. I don't know if that's something that we could pull out, but if that's one of our goals, um, 
we could be tracking it. Um, again, I think educational attainment is another piece of that because educational attainment has a big impact on our retail abil ability to attract retail and these primary employers. Um, and then instead of uh, the total number of affordable housing developments, I think we should be tracking you. Finally, I will stop talking. <laughs> Comprehensive plan filibuster. That you just <laughs> so I went through the whole thing. <laughs> so is that again? Is that something the majority of council would like to include with the? We'll how much work this is? What, what's involved in this? Is this, is this something we're able to do without consulting? Um, probably. Yeah. That, that was my question. If we can track these numbers without spending any more money. Well, I that's what I was just we're saying. gonna have to look into that a little bit. Uh, we're and, and make how sure. Much, it's just how much is that then brought? Because I see this more like baseline, like you have in here, right? And then I see what Councilor Mella just outlined as more strategic plan oriented, um, and more on the details of those, not necessarily comp plan related. I could be wrong, but I don't necessarily see those details in a 10 year, 20 year. This period. is what we were tracking in Denver. This is what we'll be tracking in Erie. Right. What we're going to be tracking. <laughs> so, in, I mean, this is something that um, measures that are indicators. They're indicators for um, our demographic and our economic success and are the policies that we have in here helping. We could be tracking vacancies retail and office vacancies. What do we know when we're looking at, why even have these policies if we aren't, why even have a plan? Tracking, but I don't know if that's necessarily in the overall structure, right? There's transportation plan, that's a whole nother document. There is a economic and financial re resilience plan, that's a whole nother document. Same with the housing. They're gonna go into a study, that's a whole nother document. It plays overall into this document. These well, need how, to be do you, how do you functionally, I, and then this is back to the other thing, is like how, like in Erie or Denver, how would you take those uh, those statistics or KPIs or whatever you want to call them and then functionally say, okay, we have these other developments coming forward. Here's how I'm going to apply this data. Is that something that you do in, in that process? Because if it is, I'd be interested to hear how you would do that because to me, that's how, what what this is, is you're applying this to development. So if you could take uh, primary jobs and apply it to what development you're going to pick or it's going to be brought forward, like how does that functionally work? So we have policies, policies in here about working with our um, school districts to help improve educational outcomes and job training, which hopefully would help us, again, move people into a, a higher, you know, help them get higher incomes, but at the same time, increase their educational um, attainment, which then again, as I mentioned, feeds into, you know, right now we don't have a great educational attainment um, demographic within Westminster, which impacts our ability to get retail, which impacts people saying we don't have good retail here. So um, there, there's this chain of events if people don't have, if they're cost burden, are we looking at more housing options, whether that's townhomes or working to get uh, workforce housing in the in the city? Um, there are a lot of a lot of elements here that we could track in a little more detail. I guess I just don't see though how that even if you track how we have control of this document around changing some of those things. I mean, they're not bad to know. I just. Well, we should probably get rid of some of the policies that we don't care about them. We're not going to track them and care. I guess I would just say is uh, when when I did this in another community, um, and, and and thinking of that experience when this was being drafted, I was looking for things that we know where to find the information and that it's easy to track on a regular basis, and the people that have the numbers. Are willing to provide you updated information because that was the challenge I had in this other community that 
people wouldn't respond to my requ repeated requests. Response. So these were based on things that I, I felt like, okay, I know where to find these. They're updated regularly. We can report back on them. Some of these sound very easy to do, but you know, having not actually checked all those out, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't want to promise. Yes, this is something we could report on all the time uh, if there's not willing partners. My suggestion is to not use everything that I just listed. Okay. It was to identify the things that lead into the success of our policies. Okay. And you know, get a little more detail so that we can track things. Um, you know, whether it's the crashes or the household incomes or <laughs> educational attainment. Yeah, why don't we we, we have a, a fairly good list here. We can we can group with our our partners um, and and look at you know what what are the things that we that we think are easily to report back to and council and, and that are meaningful. Great, thank you. Next, Mr. Baker, Councilor Baker. Uh, I like it. I think we should make a new plan. I want to include the water savings on the redevelopment and that other component. I think those are all good. I have a couple of questions. What is the most accurate land use designation? Is it map 3.2? Uh, that sounds right, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so that answers my questions about several of the properties that I asked about, because they seem to have gone from a proposed residential medium density back to the office employment designated. 13 and 16 and 35. It's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they have been office employment well office r d low density <laughs> and they've gone back to it yeah, yeah that's, except for that's also 84 the five. except for 84 northgate and if i'm reading the map correctly you printed the continued mixed use neighborhood but outside the city boundaries um no 84 is is northgate yeah 27.8 acres yeah it's it's fully inside the city the alternative proposal proposes to lower it to the residential low density. Okay, so then on map 3.2, where it has mixed use neighborhood in unincorporated Adams County is just, who knows what that is. That's the existing um, use there. Pomponio development. Okay, very good. Uh, then my other question is, so can we do the water calculation now? Uh, well, we, <laughs> The so the the employment sites, the vacant sites, that was 222 acre feet reduction. The mixed use was another. Well, instead of doing the reduction, can we just calculate? Um, yeah, we just. Can, Councilor, could you could you flesh that out a little bit for us? Sure, absolutely. I sent the email. Did you get the email? I saw an email, but I'd like to hear you. Uh, okay. So basically, according to the information we've been given, how much is the vacant land going to need for water? How many acre feet a range or approximation or whatever? So you're asking minus any sort of conservation Right, component. right, right. Minus any sort of conservation, because because you because we'll get into argument over what conservation. Well, I was going to say that's okay. that's going to be an argument. is one point two eight versus three. That's conservation. Yeah, letting lawns and trees die is not conservation. In my I guess so. we we approached it from you know an October third council challenge staff to reduce water use. So right. we we went through using that online tool. Say, okay, this side we can lower it here. We can lower this one. And so we were we were keeping a running total of, of what those savings were. So that's okay. what we were. Well, okay. Well, in that August October third meeting, the range was a thousand to thirteen hundred, right? I've got it here someplace. Roughly, I'm rounding off. Thousand. Say that again. A thousand acre feet of water to thirteen hundred acre feet of water. So if we're saving two hundred and thirty five on one project and. What were the other savings? It's 222 right. five, five, six, on the seven. other, and then another 50, so it's like 507. So so we're down to uh, anywhere between 
600 and 800 acre feet of water. As a balance, or what does that six to eight hundred feet represent? This room, not. Let me let me. Can, can I ask if I understand? Sure, Council Baker, are you asking? Because there was a gap, and are you asking a gap in today without conservancy? Yes, that that's so, specifically so if you didn't, if you didn't what I'm going to look for at all. And you're at today, and you were at the build out that this plan lays out. Would we? What would the gap? Right, exactly. Uh, if, if you ignore all conservation, all con yep. even existing conservation, yep. uh, everything would everything that we're talking about vacant would have to be open space, and that still wouldn't do it. No, if you make it all open space, you're only at uh, nine hundred eight. You cannot ignore conservation. It. Uh, it's counterintuitive to say let's let's ignore con any sort of conservation. I, I used my examples earlier. Those are real. Those are what's trending for years. It would be, uh, you know, this is all about factors of safety, right? Uh, uh, the factor of safety to ignore all conservation is so incredible that we can't. We don't have anything else to do here. I don't. Do you mind if I make a point on this? Sure. It's your turn. Um, I don't disagree with you, but but the but the bottom line is, if no conservancy happened, and we didn't have the water tomorrow, we would build to it. So I mean, I, I think that's the, the point that I wanted to make earlier. And I mean, I under, I don't want to ignore conservancy. We have to pay attention to it, but that's why we would want to track year to year, because right. then if for some reason right. the trends are going the wrong way, we would want to stop building and recalibrate what we're doing. Exactly, you're and exactly that's correct. correct. Right. And I wanted to put it into numbers instead of words. And I think we can put it into numbers instead of words. So we can track against it. Well, this is the email I sent Manager Freitag. And it asked a direct question. So I thought we were going to talk about it in this meeting. Okay. Because I used the baseline of what the city consumes as 21,000 acre feet. This peak right there. Okay, so that I use as a baseline. And then I added to it the numbers you gave us for entitled projects, but that aren't built, so using water. And that was 2,000 acre feet, right? And if this is, and this is 800 acre feet, that adds up to 23,800 acre feet, right? I, I'm not following your math, Counselor. It's uh, it's it's a moot point. If you're if you're trying to calculate something that ignores all conservation, we don't have. There's nothing left for us to discuss here. Well, don't be so grim about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I might interject here. We don't do water supply planning in the method that you're using here for a few different reasons. <laughs> the way I calculated, we're only 400 acre feet away from having enough water with this comprehensive plan. And I think if we look at the specific plans, there might be the water there. Let's let Sarah answer. Okay. In the approved plan for water usage, In the approved plan for water uses, it has entitled as about 2,000 acre feet. Okay, and that's composed of, and I jumbled up my papers so I don't have them. Here we go, right there. In the entitled water plan, so it has 2,000 acre feet. 
Okay, and this is composed of approved really developments in progress or very recently built, 221 acre feet. And I'm using the enhanced conservation, the low end. Uh, well, the uplands water budget of 778, the TO budget, the TOD budget of 453, and the down and the downtown Westminster remaining budget of 561. And first of all, Uplands told us that instead of needing 778, they could do it for 535. So there's 200 acre feet right there. And I have a hard time believing if we have 55 acres of remaining land at the new downtown, that they will need 561 acre feet of water. That's like 10 acre feet of water per acre. And if we're gonna build office buildings, office buildings only use what, two acre feet of water per acre? So there might be enough savings there to bring us to the 23,400 acre feet. Okay, can Sarah answer what she wanted to say? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of reasons why we don't do water supply planning that way. Um, when we talk about really specific numbers like that, it doesn't take into the account that we could see change, not in just land use type with the comp plan, but if you think of a commercial area that maybe there's a shoe, stair shoe store there now, it could be a restaurant in the future. And that's where we really start talking about what are the ranges of possible water supply these different land use types may use today or in the future. Um, and so that's where when we start, we get really hesitant to provide, council asked for these numbers, so we provided them. Um, but we get really antsy when we start getting really precise numbers because it's not a good way of really uh, ascertaining what our future water needs might be. And so <clears throat> we don't look at it in terms of what is built, because that might change. We don't look at it in terms of what is entitled, um, because how you define that is different. How and Andrew defines that is actually different than how Public Works defines that, because we won't consider something fully built for our modeling until we've got two years of good water data behind it. So he's gonna take the same parcel and call it something different than what we would call it based on his needs are different than our needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so what we do is we look at the entire land use map. We apply acre feet per acre to the entire land use map. And we look at what the whole city at build out is gonna be. So that lets us see kind of big picture, we need X number of acre feet between A and B acre feet. It's a range because we can't know for certain what each of those things are gonna be. <clears throat> so I think some of your questions, <clears throat> I, I hear you asking them, and some of our hesitation is we don't, we don't do any of our math that way, and so it's almost like having to backtrack out of our modeling in order to try and answer the questions that you have. <clears throat> now, I will say, because I know you were talking a little bit, Councillor DeMott, you had a question in your email about what if conservation um, flatlines. And that's actually one of the scenarios that we built into the model. Um, so if you want to get in there and look at it, the short answer is we have more risk. If our conservation trends flatline, there's more risk to the city for running out of water. Um, it's not insurmountable, um, but there is risk there. Um, we're probably in the confidence level of 80% or so of having enough water in that scenario. Um, but there is more risk. So the more we can serve, the less risk we are, no matter which land use decisions we make. I hope that makes sense. And that's 80% without these annual uh, reports that we're going to do on, on usage. Uh, and again, that's, that's sort of our purpose here, mm -hmm. is to make sure we don't get ourselves into that kind of situation where it's even only 80% uh, success probability. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess what I was going to say was, I'm sorry, Councillor Google, but you know what we heard coming out of October 3rd was, I believe, a challenge reduce 
to reduce water use, I think by a thousand acre feet was the number that was said. Well, we found even going to open space only got us 908. So that's like, what, what's the mix of land uses we could recommend that would get us, um, well, actually only about halfway there, about 507 acre feet is what we identified. So that's, that's where we were coming from with our numbers. I had a question on um, you were talking about that. Um, does the the what's the the variability of commercial versus residential? Does that have any? Is there any difference between the two? So you can sort of the residential being a lot more static than commercial employment uses. Um, can I steal your copy of yeah. this? I was looking through my I have the bar chart here too. Yeah, so if you look at, and this is small, um, but when you look at the bar chart that has the number of acre feet per area, you can see some um, have a really short grayed out area. And those are the ones that we feel pretty confident in. They're pretty consistent. Residential uses are some of our more, um, we, can, we know more about how much they're going to use. Commercial is one, uh, employment office. I'm just trying to look at the colors here. That, was, oh, that one is better. So if you look at employment office, that has a large gray area just because you end up with all kinds of different stuff in there from a water use perspective. So yeah, I was I was surprised to learn that medical offices are major water user. That was mm -hmm. that was a news news to me. To the point we almost pulled it out for our water supply planning. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, I, but I am really surprised to hear that you, the ascent you said was like 46? 43. 43%. 43% less. So I'm just, you know, as we kind of refine, as you get your two years of use, I mean, that might, um, Councilor Baker, you're, in some ways, some of this is a bit premature because we, we can actually get some better data from more recent developments and kind of look at our assumptions and maybe we are doing better than we thought. Yeah. <clears throat> but, but even if we use those calculations, we're still within striking distance now. Is that was your bottom line? Yeah. yeah. I was trying. Well, that's a positive. Well, I'm happy. Yeah. He's happy. He <laughs> said it was a go. Yeah. We could stop now. Yeah. So either way. So I mean, and that's that's why um I'll save that for my general comments. But on this, but thank you. Um See, because what we're trying to do is we're not is we're trying not to over promise not only for new people moving in here, but for our current residents. So I found there was some light at the end of, end of this tunnel. See, because I completely disagree with the use of conservation. If you have a toilet that does the same job with a gallon less, that's conservation. But you look at yards in our city that's not conservation. They're using less water, but that's not conservation. For me, those are a result of the supply demand curve for water. And we're using price to chase out current users. And I don't like that. Understood. And, and again, the vast majority of our conservation comes from indoor use. And that has a finite endpoint to it, too. Certainly would. I'm not sure what that is, but at some point, all fixtures have been changed out. Right. But who knows what the future of technology may hold also. And I can't have a front loading washer because I couldn't felt my knitting stuff that needs felting. I was, yeah. was going to actually cannot, say cannot that. You cannot do it in a front loader. I got the front loader and my <laughs> wife could reach inside of it. <laughs> it's the same the reason I time. can't have a flat top stove. You can't can on it. You have to have your canner on them. Anything else? Uh, no, that was it. Councilor Emmons, we haven't heard from you. Did you know? I'm gathering my thoughts. Okay. Well, I'll give you all the time you need okay. for that. Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, 
just um, I appreciate that you heard what we said and the adjustments here. Thank you very much for the 507 acre feet very much. I appreciate Mr. Spurgeon. You had less gray hair when we started this. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for hanging in with council. I appreciate it very much. So um, yeah, I'm as, a, as a overall, you know, that's my executive summary and that's where I live. So. So I had about 1% of Councilor Namella's <laughs> questions that, that was answered in her in her uh, questioning. I do have one remaining question, and that's related to duplexes, triplexes. In this future world, what happens to those? Um, we, we don't have a lot of that in Westminster, actually, but that would uh, generally be in our residential medium uh, type of land use. Um, typically, a unit breaker. Uh, we have permitted um, in, in past comprehensive plans, duplex development actually in our um, R3.5, which is now the residential low category. Uh, but typically those are not of the density level that would require the multifamily designations. So I believe this plan would, would support that as well as the townhome and similar uh, type of the sort of in-between type housing products. And what about alternative products like tiny homes? Um, we've we've had a few conversations about that. Uh, it's been a little while. Um, th there's actually some there's actually some impediments on the uh, building code side of the world uh, to those. But I I I, I know um, I believe next year we're anticipating new codes, and yes, we, we, we can talk to the building official if if that's something. Uh, that perhaps is is uh, loosened up as compared to older codes. Um, I, Which codes prevent that? Uh, well, well, there's there's really a, nothing prevents it. It's it's just hard for tiny homes to meet um, the energy requirements, fire code, mechanical code, all those kind of things. Um, is in my experience, um, and and also just the cost of the land. People end up pursuing something greater than a tiny home, but um, that's an interesting idea though. Um, if that's something council would like to explore. Uh, I would see a tiny home development as a group of tiny homes sooner than I would anticipate someone buying a single family right. lot for a tiny home because the, the land's just too expensive. Can, can we explore that, y'all? One That's on my. Can I ask a clarifying question? When you reference, when you use the term tiny homes, typically what we've seen in tiny homes are, uh, sorry, I should stand up, um, are homes built on a chassis. You know, they're not permanently affixed to the ground through a foundation or a basement or something. Are you referring to more of a permanent house constructed uh, in the traditional sense, or is it more of the true sense of a tiny home? Uh, that's on a chassis and can be moved because that that's typically the way they get around a lot of the building code issues but i'm not sure exactly how i think seeing works. both would be nice seeing all the options if council agrees and that was on my list because i know um at a different mayor's um, meeting longmont's got something they've had for several years now for their veterans that are homeless and they have a pretty good system set up up there and they do have a camp um, that forms communities. So my question <coughs> is, do we, because you think of mobile homes and we know what's happened with whoever owns that land. So do we have property that we would be able to control that they don't have rents for their, what they're sitting on worse than or triple what house payments or whatever but anyway I, I i don't i i've seen some places that work i don't understand how what the codes and all of that but other places are able to do it so i just think for the people that don't have homes right at the moment um it could be 
an answer. Um, it's probably something even with growing home folks that they work with that help transition. Um, I don't know. I, I just know that's a missing piece because ADUs are way too expensive. I've heard that from um, every city that does it or has it and has the ability to do it. it it doesn't make sense. Yeah, 300,000 to develop one. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Might as well just build a regular house at that point. Yeah, yeah so um, so that was on my list. Um, and I'll just go over my list because between these two, they hit every point. Um, you know that I believe we don't just build. We build to water and then we're done. We don't have to be. I, I just get so sick of hearing all the commercials. Any meeting I go to, even at the Jeffco meeting we were just at, no build, build, because we need this, we need that. Folks, we can only build to the water that, because I believe we have a responsibility to be able to offer and have water when they turn it on, it comes out the faucet if they're gonna live in the city of Westminster. We aren't gonna get more water. We have what we have. And I don't think we should be planning for every drop of it. I think it's great when I hear 43% of something. Well, don't then plan you need to build this to take up their other part. We, there are going to be days we need that extra. And so we need to decide what we need to look like, what we need to have be to be able to be sustainable and be happy. Um, and we do have those redevelopment opportunities to continue to always be looking, okay, what's missing here? what do we need to bring back or whatever but it's this is a motion thing and you have done a great job of hearing what we said i know we were frustrated um having it brought back just sitting on a shelf for six months and i i don't know if you thought the pages were or the words were going to change on the page or what they didn't and so we were probably a little harsh but you listened and we have a good product um and we're able, we know it isn't, this is the way it's gonna be, and that's it. We know we can talk about it. Um, just as we did with Uplands when they came, and um, I still think a front end process to help with a developer like that. Um, and I don't know where we're at with that Broomfield process, but um, I know it has saved their bacon more times than not, because the community and the council can look at it and say, you know, for this area, that's what they used for uh, up by our Walnut Creek. And they were going to put apartment building and they knew all the stuff going up there. Instead, they wiped it off and they're putting more of a five parks area up there. So that helped a developer not get five years into something with millions of dollars and be told this isn't going to work. So I, I Again, I, I think that's a good process and I'm just happy to hear you all verify we have on tape. We can constantly look at this. Um, I was at the Victorian Christmas on Saturday and we talked about CJ Harris because we were giving tours and you know, he was one of the first people here mm -hmm. and the teeters live in his home and it is beautiful on the inside that they've redone. But I was reminded of what his original vision for this city was. And um, he believed everybody should have a fruit tree in their yard. And that was a requirement at the time. Now that's before we had water. <laughs> that was, you had the clouds water your yard. Um, he, he made every house have space. He believed every child, every family needed space. He actually was the forebearer of open space. I mean, he knew um, everybody needed that country and to play and to have space. So he had enough um, space in between his homes. And so having read this again this weekend, um, there was a piece of him there that um, you captured, whether you know it or not. And so um, I had the banana property and we've answered that. Um, I just didn't know if we had 
made decisions about it or RTD had said, nope, we don't need it or, you know. And since I'm asking about RTD, are they ever going to look at making that a station at Westminster? Um, I mean, not bus, the train um, more frequent or is it still because of um, operators? Yeah. We, we have I a transportation have, planner here. She, and I have a meeting with her on Thursday. We meet with the we can send you 36 on that leaders. Later. I just don't know. If I they, don't know the answer. Yeah, I don't know either. Because that's a um, deterrent right now. We would have better ridership if it went every, when I was having to go down to meetings. And if because of the walk, we've got the longest walk of any of the rail stations. Um, if you were not there, it goes and you have an hour to wait. And so it's not conducive. Um, I think those were my other points besides what everybody else had. Um, not to regurgitate, but I agree with every, everything they all said. Um, and then the RTD piece, I said it in the last uh, plan, <laughs> is what is, I, I'm a little too concerned that the plan focuses heavily on rail and I just I get very apprehensive about 20 years 19 years ago that we were you know that RTD said that we're going to build things change I get that um but uh I, I feel like we're relying a little too much on that in our plan and I think it could end up hurting us in some, some sense um, I'm sorry, in the comprehensive plan or in the specific plan for stationary? Both. I mean, it's listed in mm -hmm. the comp plan. Okay. In various sure. areas. Um, so that's where I get a little um, apprehensive on that. But um, difficult to read on some of the <laughs> things that was already mentioned. Um, and then the water, along with everybody else, um, that, hey, I, this is now my second or third time bringing this up, but I so wish that we could have um, that staff brought forward for context for the public. What we see or what we had an ability to see with staff when it came to if we changed a variable here, this is what a variable outcome could be. And it could be this small or it could be this small. I think that for visually, um, for visual context, I feel like that was just an appropriate um, enlightening tool that staff sees on the back end, and it's not necessarily inherently understood on the front end. When we're saying that we're changing X, Y, Z on a comp plan, you can say all, the numbers don't change all you want, but unless someone, unless you can see it the way that um, council was able to um, sit with staff and say, um, okay, show us what you mean by it doesn't change at all. And in your perspective, it changed, you know, a, a quarter of a percent, which is l very little in big number terms. So um, I think it's another, well, this is great. And I, I appreciate um, the hard work that's, that staff has put in to change the, the comp plan. I think it was a miss on, again, not being able to contextually put into perspective just what those changes could look like and what, what, how that relates then to when we make decisions. So I, I wish that could be brought forward. Um, if we talk about this again in another context, it might be good to bring forward just as a 15 minute presentation of this is this is what we look at. That water supply model that we demonstrated with council this summer. You're not talking about having that any things like that. Not, in the not for us to be like, can you change the not for us to like study, but like just a contextually like, okay, um, we brought this in front of council and we changed XYZ. And just to put into perspective, um we're going to put this in our model and this is how we calculated that. So it's already pre-planned. It's not for us to like, you know, sit here and play. We've already done that. 
It's for staff to show on the back end how you make those decisions, how you've seen with your modeling that you all put together, that you put hours into trying to figure out what these variables look like on a comprehensive level. Um, I, you look, you're looking at me like I you have no idea what. Oh, no, I just told him I think I understand. Oh, okay. I was like, an idea. I'm reading your body language. Oh, no. it's, it's, it's a poker face. It's, it's, I don't know which way I'm it's after 10 30. I'm not at my sharpest. <laughs> I, um, you know, the Public Works Utilities Department has a has an excellent video series. Uh, there, I watch them on YouTube. I think they're available on other platforms. But we could we could promote one about hey this is how we're planning for water slide we could have a sarah or whoever showing the you know the little graph change and you change this and you move that and you know that that'd be something we could easily put together i think it'd be if you're just promoting it online i think that would be rubbed wrong um i i feel like it needs some kind of context of <laughs> um like what we just went over, right? Is there a way when this comes to council and you're presenting an overview or approval, is there a way that you could show what we have, what we went through last summer that we could show when we said, well, why don't we put this development here? And we saw the water just go out of Stanley Lake, or we said something and you could barely tell that we okay. put something there. If you just were able to show, here's what this was, here's what we've done, people could see we really do have something okay. working. That, that sounds like something that's easily. Should be yeah. like super simple, yeah. like what you showed us. Yeah, yeah now it's all, you're yeah, dragging in following. five minutes. That's it. <laughs> and I do. I know you asked personally. Um, the apartments that are in retail spaces, number one, for an entire, I don't know how long it's been going, and that bridge has been closed, you hurt the businesses because our neighborhood couldn't get over there safely because we use the bridge, we use the over, yeah, the overhead bridge. Um, I was over, somebody wanted to meet me for coffee, so we went to Caribou. I couldn't get out because I had to be in the right-hand lane that you'd normally go then south on Westminster Boulevard. It was not triggering the light and the workers could care less sitting over here. And so there was a car sitting here that was trying to get a turn to come in and I'm trying to go out. She finally went on a red light so she could get in and I went on red light to get out. But that's just because of the mess there. When you look at, and it's what you said about having the, you look at the the apartments that are along Westminster Boulevard behind Fat Cat, whatever it's called now. Um, they have some space. They have able to walk their dogs up and down there. They are not on top of the sidewalk. This is on top of, they can shake hands with the people going past them with the cars. And I don't know what that inside, if there is an inside that there have a blade of grass, but um, I wouldn't want to raise a child there. They have nothing but pavement. I don't know what thinking went into, that's a good space. And I'm told there's maybe two more that are gonna be allowed there. I just think it's insanity. I lived in a condo with my baby and child. <laughs> I didn't mind it. If it was a condo, I wouldn't care because they could at least buy it. This is rental. It's well, ridiculous. Uh, if I may, I'll go through, I think maybe some of the items we want to make sure there's council consensus on and then the more perfunctory things we'll just plan to, to clean up the other stuff. Before we go through the, the final list, I wanted to support behind the, the tiny home and at least to get information back because I didn't know if we got full four votes but um, yeah. I, I think the other piece of it that I'd like to hear when it comes back though is kind of to the mayor's point whatever we do that it, it's along with some nonprofit or management because really the whole concept there is 
there's got to be a program that goes around it, much like what we see in what we're doing with the, the homeless in Jefferson County. So whoever that is, but but I, we've heard it enough that I think we should at least have the discussion with some actual data. There's anybody that doesn't want it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I answered that maybe as best I could. There's nothing in the comp plan that would preclude a tiny home village. It's just what are the things the city could do to better facilitate? For clarity, is it, is it for the specific purposes of housing, of housing the homeless or transitioning homeless, or is it for the general population? To me, it's much like what the mayor said. There's certain populations that nationally we're seeing those programs um, do well, like veterans. For example, getting them um, back into the swing of things, um, you know. So there's probably other demographics that older Americans, homes, yeah. low income veterans. There's a lot of populations that could benefit with homes that are affordable, and those are just much more affordable just because of the size. So it could without be the permanent housing, and not just transitional housing, mm -hmm. be a lot of things. Okay. I mean, I mean obviously people have done it um, successfully, so it'd be interesting to see nationally what's been done successfully. Yeah. I told city um, manager if I take about the one in Longmont and I haven't been able to get up there, but um, I'd love to go and see what they're doing and how they did it. And I, maybe I'll be lucky and get to talk to uh, mayor of Longmont Thursday, but. Do a tour, do a council tour. I think it'd be very important where we locate this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Almost that should be the step. <laughs> anyway, you have yes. What else do you need yeses to? I haven't uh, heard too many no's. Uh, <laughs> I was going to, I'm looking at the um, the list of items Mayor Pro Tem DeMott sent. Um, in terms of, of the things that maybe we want to ensure there's a council um, a majority of support for. Uh, I'm looking here, um, uh, he, he asked, uh, or he identified that he has concerns about making Brook Hill too dense. The apartments look very crowded, out of place. What is the proper way to address that? Um, a couple of things there, I guess. Um, with that second part of our alternative proposal, we actually were proposing to remove the mixed use from the uh, 57 acres um, balance of Brook Hill to the south. Um, that would be that's sort of the low-hanging fruit answer. Um, the, a, a bolder change to the comp plan would be if you wanted to remove Brook Hill as a focus area altogether. I don't, to me, I don't think that's necessary. I think that the change you just mentioned, I didn't, didn't realize. So that's a uh, right direction. I guess my only other question, and I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure that this is the case. If, you know, there was a change that came forward, it would have to come to council at this point with some of the other changes we made, correct? So it wouldn't just be a foregone conclusion if they decided they were going to add some of that density, we'd have to specifically look at it and decide that was right for the area. Uh, yes, I would agree with that. What I would say is, you know, the, the alternative proposal staff proposed included removing the 57 acres to the south, the 14 acres to the north where Murdoch's and Three Margaritas and various other things. <laughs> um, that is one of the two vested properties that we did not include because they have recently approved development rights that would allow multifamily on that northern portion. And I think I should mention we have been in uh, communication with the property owner, and I do believe there is some interest in moving another rather large multifamily component in accordance with those PDP approvals from 2019. Uh, but that it, any project containing a multifamily component will be brought forth to the city council for your approval. I don't, I'm not, I guess I would be curious what the rest of the council say, but um, I specifically will look at it with a very close eye, um, but I'm, I don't think I'm ready to say don't, don't bring something forward. I just think that we need to really look at it. I understand that's a main, main road, but it certainly has added 
a lot of a lot of heads over there. Um, and it doesn't look the way that I anticipated it looking. I mean, to be honest, it's pretty busy over there. So, um, you know, with, with that being said, I think they, you could let them bring it as far as I'm concerned, but be a bit critical about exactly how they do it to make sure that it's not so much density that it's going to really kill that area. I believe we covered the other items through through the other parts of the discussion that maybe required others. So I think the other ones are are more basic, and we we can send you the answers um, Thank you. this week. Thank you. I think you're good to go. Change the font. Change the color. <laughs> make the make the um, make the charts understandable. <laughs> I just want to make sure that, that everybody's in agreement that as presented tonight, uh, these this alternative comprehensive plan to share um, is acceptable in concept. We've got some editing to do, um, you know, some contrasting to do, font size, a lot of those sorts of things. But conceptually, what was laid out um, is acceptable and we can now take that, start to refine it, start to go, you know, build towards a final draft. Um, and we can start to talk to some of the um, property owners, which are going to see a you know, downsizing, if you will, in their zoning. Um, and after we do that, then we take this back to the plan commission, work that process, then back to the council for approval, adoption, et cetera. And timeline on that would be March. I would I would anticipate probably March. Um, late February, but March would be more realistic. We're we need to meet with those property owners. There's going to be quite a few of them. And with the holidays, I'm just not sure how quickly we'll get sure. those. Some of the owners are out of state or out of the country even. Um, uh, but we really want to make an effort to personally contact them and, and help them understand both uh, what the change uh, is proposed, but what their options might be. Um, I'll just poll council. Yes. 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 For the record, no on the alternatives, but otherwise, yes for the complaint. Good. And thank you very much for your patience and working through this with us. It's been a long process. Um, and I think the discussion this evening was very productive. So we appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Before you flip it out, Mayor, I had the email out to council about the strategic plan. I meant to bring it up earlier. Is that something that we're all comfortable on Monday night and not a Saturday? Because traditionally we've done that on a Saturday. Everybody's a little bit fresher, in my opinion, on a Saturday, and it's consistent with what we've done in the past. Oh God, what did you ask? About the strategic planning, because right now it's planned for the fifth Monday. In, in the past, we've done that on a Saturday. What Saturday? Oh, thank you. Are we going to change too much? Do you think? What well, Monday? Thirtieth of January. Yeah. I had I sent an email out just asking the question. Because in, in the past we've done it on a Saturday. Because Saturdays are for family. It's three thought, hours total. Is that our, the idea? Our thought was three hours or less. You already have a strategic plan. You all were the ones who came up with the one that's in place. So there's not theoretically there wouldn't be a significant amount of time um, for it. You know, right now you're approving ordinances on Monday nights, you're approving budgets on Monday nights, and so it would seem that uh, the strategic plan on a Monday night would certainly be a, a, a reasonable uh, conversation also, but uh, certainly sensitive to people's work-life balance and it's taking a, a Saturday away. I would love to preserve my Saturdays, so my would be Monday night. And for Saturday, just because not a lie. By 9 30, I was exhausted and I literally, it was very, I was eating <laughs> so that I could concentrate. So that's just me. I come in with a fresh, fresh perspective. I don't have anything on my plate other than coming into council on Saturday. No. 
I think the other thing that we need to think about a Monday night is, is you know, it's a known quantity for the public. It's broadcast, it's taped, we're set up so the public can participate. Um, you go off site on a Saturday morning, it's just not on the uh, public's uh, front radar. Um, and it's where we were set up for. Yeah, but it's on a, my only point is it's on a Saturday. So it's just not part of people's rhythm. Honestly, if, if the majority says Monday, obviously I'll be here on Monday, but it is one of the most important critical things that we do. This is my multiple times that I've been through it. It's not more than any everybody here, because obviously the mayor's been through it more times than I have, and Councilor Baker is probably about the same amount of times, but I just thought it was worth the discussion because that's out of the ordinary because of what it is. And sometimes as we've seen tonight, this group, we we're all passionate about what we're doing. And this is the strategic plan is what drives everything staff does. So it's a, I mean, specifically for, for you newer folks, I think it's an opportunity that I wanted to at least make sure you were comfortable doing it on a weeknight. I originally, well, I responded to yours. I had said Saturday. So Bruce and Rich, where are you at? I'm for you Monday. I'm, I'm benign on the whole point, but. Um, At that point, there's four that said Monday. All right. You're, you're reprieved, I'm, sir. I, have, <laughs> I wasn't counting. See, I can't even count the best time tonight. We only had three on Monday. He's the, it's three and three right now. I said, son, I said Saturday. Oh, yeah, you're the deciding vote. All right. No, I was wrong. I Dean, I can't count this late on a Monday. <laughs> we do a lot of things on Saturdays. Just I, I, I'm, I'm on, um, if we were fundamentally rebuilding our strategic plan, I would say we'd have to do it on a Saturday. Sure. But yeah. I think we can do that on Monday. So, and if not, well, lesson I, learned. Yeah, and I don't disagree. And since I'm the one who brought it up and forced it, I really wanted to make sure that the, the new folks are, because ultimately there were also things that you guys lobbied for you didn't get. So this was, was your opportunity. And I think if you wanted to not be here all night Monday, that's, that's, that's a, a, you know. That's I highly easy. doubt we'll lobby for something and actually get it regardless. <laughs> so um, what are you even talking about? I think if 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 we can stay here Monday nights till one o'clock, which we've done many times on policy, we can stay for the same. It's I'm for not. me. There's no difference Saturday morning versus. I am not. Same I would hope time. we're not going to go to one on the strategic. No, I think we we need to be focused. Well, if, uh, people have well, to do their really, homework. If four of us leave. You'll have to, right? <laughs> Again, I just want to give a fair shake because that's how it's always been done for me in the past. And it's, it's that's your opportunity. I hope we still have the same opportunity on Monday. No, no, 